All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. We've reached uh, critical mass here. We've got about 30 or so folks. So um, we can go ahead and get moving today. Uh, again, I appreciate everyone uh, attending today. Uh, I am recording this meeting uh, just so everyone's aware. Uh, and I want to welcome everybody from the uh, who's attending from the, the PIM work group. Um, just to give everybody an overview of what we're going to do is um, Steve N Nadell. Is that yeah. okay. Steve Nadell from uh, a AC Triple E is going to give an overview on uh, PIMS, what's happening uh, throughout the country, and then we're going to move into legislation and third party participation. Uh, so without any further ado, Steve, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Okay, thank you. So let me try sharing my presentation. Uh, let's see. Um, give me a second. Sure. I'm just not used to Take this. Time. There should be a box on the bottom, at least on mine, there's a toolbar. Says yeah. Yeah. It's not giving. Here, let me go back a little. Um, it's. It's not giving me the choice of. You know what? Um, I'm, uh, okay, let me try this again. Okay. I'm trying to do a couple things here at once. Let me, um... Okay. It won't. I need to grant permissions to share screen. Oh, geez. Um, Chuck, do you want to send it to me and I can present? I do. Yes. Uh, I, did I Did you get it? Okay. Do you have it? Do you, ha you have it, Christine? Ah, all right. I Sorry, everyone. Literally. Oh, okay. How about now, Christine? I'm not Chuck, sure. are you able to pre uh, share your screen? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it up just in a second here. I, I was I got a, got a couple things going on here. Um, let me pull it up. All right. Let's see. All right, I got it now. Okay. Okay, so my plan is to give an overview. Uh, those of you, it sounds like there's a PIMS work group. You may know some of this, but I figured I'd start with the basics and you know the uh, current situation. And when we get to the Q and A, happy to go into more detail as people want. I'm getting there. I'm sorry. I'm struggling too, sir. Okay. Why is this not working? Okay. All right. People see that? Yes. All yes. right. And Loud and clear. Okay. Okay. Can you go uh, larger? Or if not, people, it'll be okay. Okay. Let me. Um, one second here. But in case you're wondering about the illustrations, that's, be patient and you'll see why each of those are relevant. There, yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, next slide. All right. So I know Brian's been participating. You're probably familiar with ACEEE, but extremely briefly, we do research. 
education, such as conferences, program and policy, uh, technical assistance. Christine, and can you do the questions? Of advocacy. Uh, next slide. Now, our research has shown that energy efficiency can get us about halfway to full decarbonization. This is from a study a couple of years ago, and it's, it's savings are in all sectors. That's by way of background. People have questions later. We can go into it. But let's go on to PIMS. So um, there's a famous quote from John Rowe, who at the time was CEO of New England Electric, subsequently became uh, uh, CEO of Exelon. Hey, Christine. That the rat must spell, uh, smell the cheese. Uh, and uh, he said, I'm the utility CEO, we're the rat. Give us effectively some uh, incentives so we can smell the cheese and we can will- Can you pursue, like, uh, see people's questions? Because I can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, can you do that? Okay. Uh, Judge McLean, you're not muted when you're right, talking. Sorry. Yeah, uh, next slide. So utility concerns about the impact of energy efficiency in their finances has to do with three things. With cost recovery, they want to be sure that they're, if they spend money, they will get it back. Uh, two, they are concerned that if they reduce sales, they will not be able to fully recover the fixed cost component of rates. Very roughly speaking, half of rates are variable costs, half are fixed costs. It varies from utility to utility, year to year, but extremely roughly, it's uh, on the order of 50-50. Uh, Maryland, for example, has full cost recovery. Uh, uh, likewise, decoupling, uh, um, as well as lost revenue adjustment mechanisms uh, help with the second issue. And as I recall, Maryland has uh, decoupling. Uh, but then there's also a desire to earn a return on investments. If a utility invests in a power plant and transmission or distribution, it goes into the rate base, they earn up to their authorized rate of re or approximately their authorized rate of return. And we won't go into what actual earnings are versus the authorized. Uh, ways to do this is you can actually rate base uh, efficiency uh, investments or you can do some type of performance incentive mechanisms. And it's not the two gradate into each other. It's not either or. Uh, so let's go into performance incentive mechanisms. Next. And the last one, the stool was there. We call it the three-legged stool, cost recovery, decoupling, performance incentive. So that's why the stool. Next one. So, we tend to break it into four different uh, uh, categories. There's a share of net benefits, there's savings-based, there's multi-factor, and return on investment. These are not bright lines, some gradate from one into another. And yes, there is a type of French cookie called PIMS, uh, which I decided to uh, put there to brighten things up. Uh, next. So, this is, as of the end of last year, the current status of states with uh, PIMS. Uh, um, Maryland, as you can see, has a return on equity. I think, you know, they put uh, the costs for several years into uh, uh, effectively the rate base. Um, but various other ones, probably share of net benefits is the uh, uh, most common, followed by multi-factor. Um, there are still a few that are savings-based. Um, so that's where we are. Let's go into those four types. So share of net benefits, the basic idea is you calculate the net benefits of a portfolio using your approved cost-benefit approach. You know, whatever discount rates, whether it's at the customer level, the society level, et cetera, that's all per typically the regular cost-benefit test. You figure out the net benefits, discounted net benefits over the lifetime of the measures, and then the uh, uh, utility earns a share of these net benefits, say 5% or 10%. Uh, typically, you have to achieve some percentage of the target, say 80%, before you get any incentives. And then that, when I said 5 to 10% is common, it might be, you know, uh, 5% if you hit 80%, might be 7.5% if you hit 100%. Uh, 
of your target and it doesn't go up to 10% until you hit 120% of your target. These are just numbers to illustrate. It's a fairly simple approach, but it's one dimensional. But basically you figure out the total pie and the utility gets a slice and the uh, uh, rate payers get the rest. Next slide. So savings-based is uh, you just look at savings. Uh, once the utility reaches a threshold, let's say their goal is 1.5% of sales each year, if they reach the threshold, they earn an incentive. Typically, these are based on a share of program spending. You hit it, you get 5% of spending or something like that. Uh, the utility share sometimes will increase again at its sliding scale as the savings increase. Next slide. Multi-factor are many different uh, variations. Uh, the illustrations I have here for uh, four states, these are from a few years ago. I didn't have time to update these because they're constantly changing. But in DC, they had uh, benchmarks for per capita energy consumption, renewable energy generating capacity, growth of peak electricity demand, efficiency for low income housing, uh, et cetera. Typically, energy savings is going to be a major component of these. Uh, sometimes net benefits is a major component, but then it's an opportunity to add other metrics that are important to state policymakers, such as have you met certain low income thresholds? Have you done certain things that uh, might help uh, uh, meet uh, greenhouse gas reduction goals, whatever? Each state decides it, and typically these are uh, set Oh, I say the most common is to set them for a three-year period. You set the targets, you set the metrics, but then three years later, they get uh, tweaked. Uh, perhaps some new things get added, some old ones get uh, subtracted. Um, I'd say the trend is moving more toward multi-factor. Uh, next one. And then you have return on investment. And here's a couple of examples coming out of Illinois where based on how much of the goal they achieved in this, in the case of ComEd, it's whether it's, uh, they don't get, uh, uh, whether it's uh, uh, less than 75, 75 to 100, et cetera, they get, uh, if it's less than 75, they actually get a penalty. It's minus uh, uh, 200 basis points. Uh, if it's under the goal, it's a smaller, by a little bit, they have a smaller penalty and then uh, uh, it goes up as they exceed the goal. I know in Maryland, and I'm gonna be dating myself, some of the utilities a number of years ago were reluctant to go this direction because they were, wor uh, they were worried about the penalties. They liked the incentives, but they really didn't want the penalties. That was uh, uh, the person who told me this has since left uh, the Maryland utility. I won't uh, say which utility, so that may have changed, but that was a concern uh, in Maryland. Uh, next uh, slide. Um, so those were the four methods. Uh, we went back and looked at the data that we had collected for our uh, 2020 uh, state scorecard. And on average, the uh, utilities, the states where they have PIMS were achieving about 0.94% of sales savings. Those without PIMS were achieving about 0.5, so nearly double the impact in states with PIMS. Uh, the overall average was in between. I'm not saying PIMS drove this all. We have some older data indicating that PIMS helps, that having an energy efficiency resource standard helps, that having decoupling uh, helps. All of these help, but definitely, even after you control for the others, this was the earlier data. We didn't have time to do it for the most recent data. Uh, PIMS also has an impact. Uh, next slide. Uh, some of the more recent data on size of incentive, uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, uh, it's about 5% of spending. Uh, um, Hawaii, it's more like 3.3 .3 of contractor costs there. They have a third party administrator, so it's how much they pay that contractor. Uh, Michigan's a bit more generous. Uh, it's capped at 15% of uh, spending. Uh, New York, it's mostly um, 
based on a return on investment, they go up to 100 basis points. So those are uh, some examples. Uh, next slide. So trends, as I mentioned before, there appears to be movement toward multi-factor incentives. There may be a substantial net benefit or savings component but multi-factor allows you to also add a few other things that are important to policymakers. Uh, it used to be when we we do these studies periodically, quite a few states gave incentives of 15% or more. Those are generally coming down. I knew of one state that was up to 25%. And uh, we did a study on that and the regulators said, wait, we're the most generous in the country. Maybe we don't need to be quite so generous. Uh, now they're mostly uh, in the 5%. It needs to be enough to capture management attention, but it uh, doesn't have to be so generous that uh, uh, um, you know, you're giving more to the shareholders than they need and less to uh, ratepayers. Just to tell one story, I remember one utility uh, executive once told me this was the manager in charge of energy efficiency. So I don't speak to the CEO that often. Whenever I bump into him in the hall, he's always asking me how I'm coming along with his $5 million. At that point, it was that was the incentive he could work. It got top management attention. He knew I better hit these goals if I want to keep my CEO happy. And so I think that's what, uh, next slide in case. Oh, I have, yeah, one final. I would note there are variations. We did a report on PIMS for demand response. RAP did a presentation on PIMS for reliability and resilience. There's uh, some work on performance-based rates of which energy efficiency may be one of many components. And I linked to an article that uh, talks about uh, some of those. Uh, United Kingdom in particular has been doing this for many years, but for our purposes, I focused on energy efficiency and it's starting to be, it's not just energy savings, but also GHG reductions. So final slide. Um, as I noted, PIMS can get management attention and can drive higher performance. They provide an opportunity to get some type of return, whether it's a formal rate of return or uh, uh, just a uh, shared savings or savings-based incentive, just as utilities earn a financial return on grid investments, and it can be used to reward performance in important areas. Obviously savings, but low income programs is common, coordination with others, greenhouse gas impacts, et cetera, whatever is important. That's what I have to say. Uh, the next slide is just my contact information in case people have questions. And I'm happy to both take questions and uh, have discussion and Chuck, I assume you will uh, manage this. You are muted, Chuck. Got it. It is not my day. Um, <laughs> yes, Taylor, I will circulate the uh, slide deck as, as soon as I get a chance. Um, yes, Joe. Joe, you got your hand up, sir? Yes, and I'm I've been talking. Um, hi, Steve. This is Joe Loper. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I was wondering if you could talk to some of the challenges with uh, the PIMS, uh, particularly with respect to evaluation. And I know, you know, the, the kind of debacles that, that were occurring at least 10 years ago and whether those, well, in California, I'm speaking specifically to California, there were some huge challenges there. Uh, and I'm wondering if uh, if some of those have been resolved or what your perception of that is. I haven't been hearing lately about major evaluation challenges in terms of PIMS. Obviously, there's always some contention on evaluation. There are judgment calls to be made when there's money at stake that could exaggerate uh, things. But, uh, you know, the evaluation contractors, the PSCs have often work many of these issues through. I'm not saying things are perfect. I'm not saying they are questions. But if you're doing evaluation year after year, you kind of know, OK, those will be used for PIMS. We'll provide the same, uh, uh, you know, the same general mechanism. Not perfect, but it, I haven't heard of uh, 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 big problems lately. I don't know, Joe, if you have heard lately 
yes, uh, California, as always, is uh, has lots of people who are uh, can generate some controversy. But and at the moment, the, their PIMs are kind of suspended while they figure out what the next step is. Yeah, I, it, well, it's, I know it in other jurisdictions where we've worked on evaluations where it's been, at least there's a lot of debate, you know, especially when you, if the goal is, uh, uh, for example, around lifetime net savings, uh, then you get a lot of arguments about, well, how are, you know, how are your surveys designed, you know, to get your net to gross yeah. and all those sort of things. So in Maryland, our goal, you know, at least currently is gross. Well, currently it's gross first year. Um, so it's relatively easy to tie something you know, to tie some sort of incentive to that. Not I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it's relatively easy when you start right. getting out into GHG long-term, those sort of things. Uh, I can yeah. see where it could be really challenging. Real challenging doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Just saying I'm-, I'm Right. Uh, the more assumptions you have to make, the more subject to challenges they are. You may yeah. want to do them because those things are important, but the more complicated you make it, yes, the more things can be questioned. Yeah, and the more you got to lock things down in advance so everyone knows how they're being, uh, how their performance is being measured, and yeah. that then kind of ties your hands on the ex post side when you're going to try to provide right. the most accurate representation of what's happening with the programs. So right, I mean, some states effectively have deem savings, so you know exactly what the savings will be once you know participation, and they do the evaluations periodically to reset those deem savings values. So that's yeah. Yeah. one way that uh, can minimize controversy yeah we've wrestled a lot here with uh, just what 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 is within the control of the utilities right because that's what you, that's the performance you want to measure you know not not whether dishwasher cycles have changed uh you know dishwasher cycles per day have changed sort of thing so anyway thanks thanks for being here steve sure uh dylan Looks like Dylan hit his Dylan? delete button. Nope. And um, <clears throat> like Joe, I was I was also talking away. Um, thank you. Hi, Steve. Um, Dylan Vore, he's with VEIC, um, working with the uh, Office of People's Council um, here in Maryland. And I have a, uh, uh, I guess, a comment or suggestion um, and then a question. Um, so in in Maryland, um, the costs of Empower are amortized, and the utilities earn their their whack. Um, and so, as you uh, noted, that that's clearly one leg of the stool, and there's there is decoupling. Um, but I, I, others can comment on this, or you can you can comment if you want, Steve. Or, or but but I think it, it, it's worth distinguishing because there is not an adjustment to earnings based on performance. There are targets, of course, and, and goals, but there isn't in Maryland, unlike I think what you showed in, in Illinois, there is not a mechanism to adjust yeah. those earnings based on performance. And that, that's been a, that remains a subject of a lot of conversation. And maybe you should wait until this work group finishes um, this year before you consider updating your, your math. Okay. But, that's a that's sort of a comment on where I see Maryland. Yeah. Um, but my question is a little bit: um, Can you speak a little bit to, you know, performance incentives that are based on sort of savings or other desired outcome versus spending, which of course is a necessary way to get the outcome, but of course is not what we're trying to incent. And um, sort of about you sort of pros and cons of those, and also. You know, I guess what you're getting a little bit of both in many states because you have you have a incentive that's based on performance of savings or another category, but it's multiplied times spending. So you're you're actually you know capturing both in some way. But can you speak a little bit to any of those yeah. questions? Thanks. Right. I would say, uh, and I have to do an exact count. Most uh, states are using savings, as you kind of uh, said. We care about performance, uh, not how much money you spend. You don't want to encourage people to spend lots of money on things that are barely cost effective, nor the highly cost effective uh, thing. So most are doing uh, based on uh, savings. 
either fully or, you know, indirectly, it's, you know, net benefits or savings is one of multiple things. Uh, when I said 5%, usually there are caps on the amount of uh, incentives based on spending, but it's not like it's generally, except for the uh, savings-based ones, most states, it's not a direct factor in most of the calculations as opposed to just a, a, a cap. I mean, obviously doing on spending is easy. We all know how to measure uh, spending. Uh, we've been doing it for, you know, a century or more in terms of, you know, relatively modern accounting standards. But uh, uh, if we want performance, whether performance is energy savings or GHG, you got to do it based on that. And yes, you do get into some evaluation issues, as Joe pointed out, but uh, our view is, yes, you want it on performance and the uh, uh, spending just a, might be one way you do the cap. You could also do the cap as Illinois did. Uh, it's, you know, it's up to 100 or 200 basis points. You know, there are different ways to quote cap it. Thank you. Uh, Julia. Thanks very much for the presentation, Steve. Um, this is Julia Friedman with Oracle Opower. Uh, so this group has considered, um, you know, moving to a greenhouse gas based, like primary goal in the future. And so curious to see, if, you know, looking across the country, do PINs, when states start thinking about greenhouse gas emission reductions and turn it into those types of metrics, do PIMS change? Is it a, as simple as changing the wording or are there other you know, considerations for creating GHG metrics. Okay. As you perhaps, as you probably know, and I suspect it's come up, there are different ways of doing it. There's outright KWH and THERMS. There's also BTUs, which starts getting into some of the fuel choice uh, issues, or you can do uh, GHG. Uh, GHG, as Joe kind of alluded to, you there is more uncertainty. Are you talking GHG this year or lifetime GHG, which means you have to make assumptions about the generation mix. Uh, most states are still doing some type of energy, but Massachusetts, New York uh, come to mind as two that are doing uh, significant components based on New York is BTUs, I believe Massachusetts, as I recall, G getting into GHG. Uh, one thing to be aware of is you still may want to have some, uh, con even if you move to GHG, and, I, and yes, that is the uh, desired long-term goal, you may want to also have some type of energy component. Do you want all the money, for example, to be spent on electric vehicles? You get a lot of GHG savings by getting rid of gasoline and diesel uh, um, and replacing with electric vehicles and ignoring industry and buildings. Uh, the other way to do it is sector things, but just be aware if it's strictly GHG that will have very different incentives on the program mix than current programs. And you may decide, gee, that's great, but you may say, uh, for example, no, we really want buildings. You know, just to give an example, I saw the uh, uh, Maryland uh, uh, report on uh, um, decarbonization. And originally they were talking about having dual fuel systems. And they decided if we do enough energy efficiency, we don't need to do that. But you know, I would hope uh, if that's going to be the state strategy, I would hope that we do enough building uh, related energy efficiency and not just cars, or else we might have some winter peak problems down the road on cold days like today. <laughs> Got it, thank you. And is there, sorry, there's <laughs> an excited dog in the background. Um, is there uh, any, you know, when you think about creating incentive mechanisms that kind of reflect the policy objectives, like with, if you're moving to climate, is do you see any trend of creating incentives that change over time to reflect like the urgency to act on climate? The What I have seen is most states reset them typically every three years. And when they do a new every three years, they uh, update uh, 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 things. And some states like Massachusetts, I was 
I emailed someone to get a copy of their latest, but I guess they were too busy. I didn't get it yet, but I'm pretty sure the brand new one that has yet to be uh, approved, the proposal, it's a consensus proposal, uh, does include uh, GHG, but I, I don't have the actual one, so I can't absolutely say for sure, but that's something new that I believe they are adding that wasn't in the last three-year proposal. Got it. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Baba Tunde. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Um, Steve, um, what do we know about um, the effects of um, of PIMS on um, ratepayers on the short on the short run and on the on the long run, based on experience with other states? Right. I mean, PIMS do slightly add to program costs. Call it five percent, and yes, ratepayers pay that but they drive a lot more performance, which helps reduce uh, the cost to ratepayers because these are cost-effective programs that are cheaper than the alternative. So I think the net result is almost always going to be ratepayers' benefits. They pay a little, but the benefits in terms of both reductions in their actual uh, consumption as they participate in the programs or reductions in rates relative to business as usual because there are less investments needed uh, will be positive and will benefit ratepayers. Now, this is all subject effectively to cost effectiveness testing. And, you know, I usually, when you do the cost effectiveness test, that little adder for PIM should be included. You don't ignore it. Thank you, Steve. All right. Anybody else? Anybody have any questions or comments? Yes, Joe. Hey, Steve. Is uh, uh, have any of these other states, uh, or have you thought about PIMS in the context of uh, screening, cost effectiveness screening? Uh, so, for Maryland, uh, the sector we have sc screening at the sector level rather than the program level. And earlier, you yeah. said one of the advantages of PIMS is that it would uh, promote cost effective. You know, promote. Uh, you know, more program, but also discourage some of the less cost effective programs. And I just wonder how that fits in because we're doing, you know, currently a lot, a lot of the programs within the portfolios, uh, especially on the res side, are not cost effective unto themselves, but they're co highly right. cost effective at the portfolio level. Right. The comment I was making that if it was strictly as a percent of spending, it doesn't reward performance. Obviously, net benefits heavily rewards uh, performance. I was more saying be careful about doing cost-based uh, incentives, you know, just percent of uh, uh, spending as opposed to some performance measure. Uh, but yes, you have the screening by sector and you make sure it's uh, overall cost-effective and each one balances programs that are highly cost effective versus those that are barely or sometimes not such as low income programs these are policy decisions but you make sure that overall it, uh, the portfolio is cost effective and will uh benefit ratepayers so uh pims is just a a small little adder you should continue doing what you think makes the most sense for maryland and i say that as a maryland resident so yeah and are the PIMS uh, in other states, are there any states that have, uh, you know, sub sub portfolio PIMS, you know, that are more granular that uh, uh, direct performance towards, you know, commercial sector or the res sector or, you know, as opposed to just savings and. I haven't looked at every single PIMS lately, so I can't say absolutely, but the way it typically comes up is multi-factor, you know, the most common multi-factor is whole bunch is based on savings, uh, a whole bunch maybe based on net benefits. And then there are a few adders. Typically uh, for low income is a very common one. They want to make sure low income performance, but you could do others. I'm not aware of people who are saying, oh, we want a special adder for commercial industrial. Usually the issue is commercial industrial is more cost effective. Uh, utilities would do a lot of those you have it for residential or for low income just to make sure they get a reasonable share yeah yeah i could see uh uh you know just thinking out loud we've had discussion i know opc has been uh, pressing for uh some more evaluation on our uh, midstream programs for example than 
limited income always comes up um, where you could direct PIMS to try to drive more program in certain areas, right? So you may not want to provide PIMS to promote res lighting programs because, you know, there's no problem getting people to do those. Uh, it's, you know, it's the other programs uh, where you're trying to get more participation. So right. just wondering whether anybody's targeting in that, in that way, it sounds like not so much beyond limited right. income. To oversimplify, I know I, I just saw the New York one, which is frankly struck me as rather complicated. Uh, from what I have seen, I would tend to think if you do multi-factor, think about five uh, metrics, not try to do more. Almost generally, you know, savings is one, uh, net present value is another, and that implies uh, picking three that are most important to you. Uh, and you probably wouldn't get down at the level of lighting as opposed to, you know, say, low income or something like that. And yes, I'm aware in Maryland that uh, uh, the low income programs are managed elsewhere. Maybe it's moderate income, you know, or whatever. All right. Thanks, Joe. Uh, anybody else? Oh, okay. All right. Let's see. Anybody else for Steve? Got a question, comment? Sir, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate your uh, presentation and taking time out to uh, give everyone the uh, the scope of uh, PIMS Cross Country. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, if you have further questions, let me know, uh, perhaps via Brian or you have my email. You can just email me directly. Will do, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Take care. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Okay, bye. All right. So that concludes our PIN portion of today's presentation. Anybody who just joined for that, uh, obviously you're more than welcome to stick around. Um, if not, uh, for those of you that are going to leave, uh, I'll send out an email to the PIM distribution list uh, to let you know uh what our schedule is going to be in the future moving forward once we get through legislation and third-party participation all right and with that uh let's move on to um staff uh mr harley are you there sir good morning everyone yes i'm here sorry i was late and missed the the pim discussion but i guess i'll check the recording out later on to yep, see what yep, i missed uh, <laughs> i will post it on youtube um uh, Dan, there were uh, some comments about the, um, I guess, the current process uh, that staff has or the commission has for selecting third-party vendors or or the technical conference you put on. Um, can you kind of give a, a brief overview of that, sir, how that currently works? Yeah, so for the last several program cycles prior to the beginning of that cycle, we uh, staff tries to send out a letter and invite third parties and interested uh, businesses to uh, submit to staff uh, proposals for you know new programs for the next program cycle or even you know uh, improvements on current programs. Um, generally, we'll give like uh, you know one to one month to six weeks for responses and we try to set up meetings uh with with uh the utility staff opc and other interested parties to uh have those groups give presentations on their ideas and then be able to answer questions from from the uh from the various parties uh at kind of at the end of the day it's um uh utility decision on 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 whether they move forward with the with that idea to include in their new program cycle um i think there th that might drive some of the, the i think there's some varying opinion about how much say other parties should have within what new program should be included uh generally it's been uh, utilities are responsible for the programs so generally it's uh, they've been given some latitude as far as what programs they wish to accept uh, and that's kind of the basic process for when we try to invite in new new parties to uh, develop program ideas for Empower. All right, thank you, sir. Um, before we move into any other uh, you know staff's comments, does anybody want to comment on that third party? Yes, Lindsay. Uh, hi. Yes, I'm hoping you can hear me. Yeah. Um, 
so Dan, I did have a follow-up question. I think some of the comments about the kind of empower new program um, process, there seemed to be a bit of a comment about the actual decision-making process once that um, technical conference happens. How how are the programmatic decisions made at that point? Because that, that seems to be a bit of a black box for those who have participated in that before. Yeah, at, at the end of the day, the, the utilities have give, give, are given kind of a wide berth as far as what they want to put in their program plans as they're responsible for meeting the goals and uh, you know the cost recovery. Um, other parties do have input, but um, I think that's maybe one of the sticking points in some of the other comments is that some of the other parties feel that you know, they, maybe the utilities have too much say in this, but that's kind of been how we've done it. Um, so that's my answer to that. Great, thank you. Uh, Joe. Yeah, I have a, a, I guess a question to the group related to that. Um, I think some uh, in some of the comments there seem to be, uh, or maybe a perception out there that the utilities don't want to, you know, are, are dragging feet on some of the programs. And it's curious to me because I'm not sure what incentives they would have to do that. And so I can see performance, you know, I can see this in the context of PEMS where uh, you want them to perform better, but in terms of uh, the utilities uh, taking on new program ideas, they have implementers who are fully in the game, you know, ICF and Honeywell, and those guys are, uh, you know, pretty go to all the conferences and are aware of all the different um, uh, things you can do in this in this realm. And the utilities get get uh, their cost recovered along with some incentive uh, for spending. And so I'm, I guess I'm just I'm curious. I can't I don't see where that where that feet dragging is occurring. And by the way, I'm I'm asking this partly in context of the incentives and what the objective, you know, what just getting clarity on that, the value, which is going to be a value weighted and valuable. You're, You're muted, Justin. Ah, right. uh, God, again, Dan, did you want to respond to that or anyone from the utilities? Um, I would open that up to uh, anyone else for, for that response. All right. Go ahead, Dylan. So um, this is a this is tricky territory, but I'll just I'll just give some a, a quick answer to that, Joe. Um, uh, two two pieces. One is I I think that utilities are naturally extremely conservative. That is just a fundamental sort of observation about risk taking um and but secondly and more importantly that's what the research shows i mean and 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 steve nadal went over it very quickly but the the evidence is that performance incentives result in more performance so it's i don't i think it's 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 challenging to sort of have to sort of frame the question in terms of you know, well, the utilities are dragging their feet. And I, I don't think that's quite necessarily the constructive way to, to, to frame it. But the, the evidence is very clear. And John Rowe, you know, had a, a catchy phrase about it, but the evidence is, is pretty clear that that is the result that you get. And un unpacking all of why that is and, you know, what's happening differently that may be important or may not be important because it may be at the end of the day that we're satisfied that if you give an entity a financial incentive to to perform toward a certain end that they're more likely to do that that's not a disparagement um it's yeah. just you know so i can i can i can see uh you know if you if you can figure out an implementable performance incentive to drive uh, utilities to perform better in the programs that they're doing. Uh, what I don't, what I've, what I've missed, it's been, it's gone on for several program cycles where there's this kind of, a, I think, assertion by some that uh, the utilities, you know, don't want to try new things, don't want to do new programs, don't want to, uh, and I just don't see why they would have, especially if you don't have a performance incentive, right? They're not even tied. They don't even have a, a performance requirement. All they got to do is uh, kind of meet an overall goal and and spend money and you know there's as you've 
as you and others have pointed out numerous times, there's very little risk to the utilities of doing these programs. So I'm I'm just trying to understand where is the why would why would the utilities not if they could you know if they can justify a program in fact they do a lot of programs that are not justifiable on a cost effectiveness basis why they would uh not want to do them so it might be helpful to um uh just speak briefly and nicole can jump in but to a comment that was in um, one of the opc comments about this process and it was a little bit less about the utilities um taking ideas from the from that process in fact I think OPC noted that um, the utilities probably do benefit from, you know, pitch the pitches of, of new ideas. But in terms of third party programs, um, I don't think that process, uh, I think it's pretty clear that that process has not resulted in third party programs coming out. And it's not surprising because, you know, if you want to use the definition that Mr. Gavat offered, which I thought was pretty good about what a third party pro pro program is. It's one that's not that's not run by the utilities. So it's it's not surprising that a process that is, as Dan suggested, it really gives the utilities, you know, the ability to decide what, whether or not to move forward with something has not resulted in third party programs. So that's a little bit of a, of a narrower point. Um, than what you're asking, but but maybe but maybe you be maybe asking based on um, that that comment. Go ahead, jump in, Nicole. Good morning, Your Honor. We we agree the technical conference is a way for the utilities to get some ideas from third parties, but it's distinct from a third party program where there might be a different implementer of that program. And I don't, maybe further on, I could explain our thoughts in general on third party programs. I know we're not presenting right now, but but there is a distinction there between, you know, listening to ideas and incorporating ideas, many of which are great, but and then having that entity actually implement a program. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Anybody from the utilities want to comment on this? Who's up? All right. I'm going to call. Lori, are you there? I'm just picking on you. Got to get myself on. Oh. I was I was debating. I think everything we said we said in our comments. Right. Okay. Um, but I'll do a quick reiteration in that, and it came to the PIMS too, that Maryland is the top state in the country. I think we're six. I have to look at my notes, but I believe we're that AC Triple um, has us as number six in the country. So it's concerning to me trying to make. I mean, we're changing our goal structure, but it seems it's concerning to me that if a process is working to the point that we're nationally recognized the state, um, why we would do something else. The other concern overall is somehow it's going to get put into the surcharge and the cost of having a third party outside of the utility, getting RFPs, hiring evaluators, filing reports that the commission and the commission staff has to review um, all the administrative you know invoice tracking and concerning is the brand of empower maryland you know our programs are front facing we're in people's homes so it's concerning to me that you know we want to make sure the empower maryland brand doesn't cause issues there and also you know, the marketing side of Empower Maryland, you know, it was it two or three years ago, there was a lot of work done on the Empower logo and its size and its positioning and attribution to Empower. Not saying all of this can't be done, but what ends up happening is it increases costs that have to be recovered from, and the recommendation for this is, you know, coming from a point where we're also told, keep your surcharge down. So. I, I find that a little bit concerning, particularly since we're not number 48 out of 50, we're number six out of 50. So, you know, I, it, it just seems like change for the sake of change is not necessarily the best approach. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Um, that kind of covers where staff and the utilities stand. Um, Nicole, did you want to kind of give a brief overview or? 
you know, maybe um, cite your areas of disagreement of kind of. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. So Nicole's like on behalf of OPC. So we we don't feel we understand that Maryland is is rated six in the nation. We understand that, and that's great. But we also don't feel that we should accept accept the status quo. There are ways to continue to strive and improve. And there are also best practices of the most energy efficient jurisdictions, and we should strive for adoption of those practices. Maryland is doing well with some of them, but it could improve in other areas. And we should always, always be striving to reduce costs to rate payers while increasing savings and benefits. So in terms of costs of programs, there are costs of the utility administered programs. In addition to the very large costs of the unamortized balance, which we're concerned about and which the commission has noted its concern with several times, there's also the costs that ratepayers pay through the BSA. And we're still assessing those costs, but I don't think, I think we have to recognize that utilities administering these programs do come at a cost, just as there would be a cost for third party administration. And it's also worth considering whether third parties could offer expanded benefits, either expanded benefits, increased benefits, or benefits in categories where Empower is not excelling, and that would be in the equitable, equitable distribution of benefits and the areas of market transformation, as an example. And this is basically, it, it's worth consideration. What we're saying is that it's worth consideration. There is room for improvement, and I don't think we should just assume that, you know, because we're six in the nation, we can stop there. I think we should continue to strive and improve. And briefly, we did mention a stakeholder board, and I think there was some concern raised that this would be duplicative of the commission, but there are roughly 10 states where a stakeholder, a stakeholder board is used, and those states have commissions as well. And if anything, it appears that that stakeholder board helps the commission with its work because it can often help reach a consensus on certain issues. So we don't think that would be a du duplicative thing, and we think that it's working well in the states that it's happening in, and it's something to consider for Maryland. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. So would you kind of say your stakeholder board, it would be like a, a smaller kind of work group type type environment where, where hopefully, I don't know, I don't want to say ties are broken, but recommend, you know, and, uh, you know, I don't know how to explain it, but it was just kind of like another layer, so to speak. Yes, Your Honor, I think it, it would be another layer. And, and it, it we obviously we have work groups and these work groups, you know, are doing similar. To, <laughs> they're, they're working well, but the stakeholder board is just another level where essentially there could be more attempts at reaching consensus so that when things are presented to the commission, there's a better chance of moving forward and getting consensus on those issues. And I think Dylan could probably explain more on this but it, it's working well in the states that it does exist in, and we think it's something to consider. I have a question for you on your, um, for third parties, um, and, and I, I agree that, you know, just because we're six, you know, we shouldn't just, you know, sit there and say, yeah, you know, we're six, we want to try and be number one, but in terms of, of costs, would you, would you see, I don't know, I guess, and I guess we can get to this um, in our next subject, but like with bill impacts, if we give, um, programs to third parties, do you see that, um, would that be like in addition to what the uh, utilities are already doing or maybe instead of one of the programs they're doing, uh, just in terms of keeping the costs lower? Yes, Your Honor. I don't think they should be du duplicative efforts. And I think MEEA said they shouldn't compete. We agree with that. I think it would be for certain areas where maybe the utilities aren't doing as great of a job as, as could be done. Maybe there are certain entities that could do those jobs better. Um, we know that with equity issues, we've had trouble, you know, even establishing a goal for metrics for the low income customers. And maybe there's an entity out there that could do that better. Market transformation, um, for example, we know we have this, this continual issue of whether to incentivize gas equipment and where there's a little bit of pushback from the utilities on that, and maybe there's an entity that, that could do that better. So there are certain areas where we think it's worth considering maybe a third party can do this better or at a lower cost to ratepayers. So I, I don't, we're not suggesting duplicative efforts. Um, that would, I agree that that would spend a lot of money probably unnecessarily. We're talking about giving third parties the opportunity, or at least considering giving third parties the opportunity for things that they could do better. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Hurley. Uh, 
just a question for Nicole. Um, so if there, if we were to have a third party move in and take over a, a program that ABD utilities aren't running so well, are they, are we then going back and adjusting the utilities goal to come down a little bit to account for that shift? Or are we trying to combine all programs into the one goal we're looking at for the greenhouse gas reductions? That's a good point, and that's something I think we'd we'd have to talk about. What do you think, uh, Lori? Go ahead. Um, um, I think it'd be tough to hold the utilities responsible for something out, completely out of their control. But Lori, I'm sorry. You you spoke my words. I will okay. put my hand down. All right. Yeah, I guess we'd have to consider reworking the goal in some in some respect. Uh, yes, Mr. McClellan. Uh, thank you, Honor. Uh, Josh McClellan with Washington Gas. Uh, question for Nicole. Is OPC aware of any states or um, or just anywhere, any regions or anywhere throughout the country where there is a heavier, heavier presence in third party administration of energy efficiency utility programs that have somehow either done better than utilities? Do we have that data in front of us to show that, hey, a third party implementation model could be more successful? Is Have you seen that anywhere? I, I would have to gather that information. I think Dylan can jump in on that, actually. Um, Dylan Voorhees with, with BAC. Josh, your question about, um, so there's there's at least, there's two different things that I think uh, have been, uh, come up in comments, uh, OPC comments and others. W one is sort of uh, pro third party pr program um, third party programs and then sort of overall third party administration uh, of, of like a portfolio. And, and I, I, your question might be about the, the, the program side. Obviously there are, um, states with third party administrators. Um, and I think the evidence and this, I think, uh, OPC's in, initial comments spoke to this a little bit, the evidence on third party administration does not suggest that third party administration in itself results in uh, you know, statistically different uh, performance, but there are a couple of different factors that ACCAPLE and Brattle and others have said do lead to uh, better uh, better sort of savings or other outcomes. And those include some of the things that Steve Nadell was talking about today in terms of performance incentives. They they include um, things like having robust stakeholder, you know, engagement along the lines of what Nicole's talking about. So those are the things that that really matter. And 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 I think OPC is sort of raising the question: Do we have those pieces? And that informs uh, the lens through which we should think about third parties. Um, so that's at the sort of full high sort of administrative level. Um, I don't know if you were thinking about sort of at the program level. I do think there are states there there are states that take pieces of of programs, and Maryland is of course one of them, uh, and and have non utility parties run programs. Um, so I don't know if I'm going to answer your your question or or missing something. No, I, I think it I think it is important to kind of delineate between program administration and those you know overarching pieces that you described versus specific programs that aren't run by utilities but may, are funded by surcharge and, and, and utility ratepayer dollars. So, um, yeah. no, I think that kind of answers it. I I, I just didn't know. Um, yes, we do have you know a, a, a approach like that in Maryland. You know, with uh, with the DHCD and maybe some other entities, but I didn't know if there was an, a. a you know, I, I would still consider that just a portion of the overall Empower Maryland portfolio and all the energy saving programs that are out there. I just wanted to know if there was something where third parties are more prevalent in offering these programs in other states and have that has that shown to be, you know, more effective than, you know, a, a utility heavy program led uh, mechanism that we kind of have here in Maryland. Uh, just a quick, quick follow up on that. I see a bunch of, a bunch of hands up, Your Honor, but but I think that the the areas uh, where that's more common, Josh, have to do with um, parts of energy efficiency portfolios that are um, linked to um, 
you know, things such as market transformation, as Nicole said. So, you know, building codes and standards, um, which are, you know, I would say sort of under the umbrella that, or, or can be in, in different states. Those can be actually run by utilities as well. But um, I think things that are linked to market transformation, other kinds of state policies, some of those equity related goals, as opposed to sort of like resource acquisition, to use the sort of term of the industry where you're just trying to maximize, you know, therms or kilowatt hours. Um, so I think those are not, not, not exclusively, but I think that is um, that those are the types of areas where you're mo more likely to see a third party. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Dylan. All right, got a few hands up. We've got Lloyd, Joe, and then Baba Tunde. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, for the opportunity to talk, Lloyd Cass here, Franklin Energy. I um, I just wanted to, you know, I, I I filed some comments on behalf of Franklin, where we are what we would call a third party program implementer, and I and I raised that because, you know, as as Julia will um, speak to, I think, it uh, better because in her comp because I thought her comments were great on this. We've got a first. Well, as part of the conversation, define what third party means, but I'll I'll make some assumptions for my comments. One of the things I want to say is that, first of all, with with the you know to piggyback on the PIMS conversation, crafting multi-factor PIMS that advance certain objectives will can and will and have proven in other jurisdictions to create additional traction in underserved markets and other types of things. And I think the utilities, uh, because of the, uh, you know, should have an opportunity to make those improvements under a new framework because they will be prompted by the right, the potentially right, right incentives. Um, so I think there are opportunities, for example, to have third parties, like maybe some are thinking of um, work you know, as a third party implementer under a utility program. And the benefits there are numerous, particularly to the point um, that uh, I think it was Lori made where you, there was, there was a lot of fixed costs to program administration and you, you want to, you want to, you want to keep those down. And there's a, and the, one of the most expensive things in any program is customer acquisition. And when you have, in, you're inevitably going to have situations where even though you try to avoid overlap, over time, these programs evolve and they end up t tackling the same customer and there, and there ultimately is overlap. And then you're paying for ratepayer dollars to market to the customer multiple times. And that's not a, a good thing. And the last thing I'll say is the utilities are able to increasingly stack these financial benefits with customers. So stacking energy efficiency with demand response as it becomes more integrated um, with, you know, you know, th this state may, I don't know, may end up doing other things such as, um, you know, non-wires alternatives where you're trying to um, avoid investments in the distribution system. And you can, and when you're, the utility is the umbrella for all of the third parties, uh, um, it, 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 it creates a lot more efficiency and a one-stop shop experience for customers. So I'll stop there. All right. Thank you, sir. We'll get through these, um, Joe and then Baba Tunde, and then uh, definitely want to circle back on <clears throat> defining what we're talking about because uh, in terms of third parties, because there were some questions in the comments uh, as to exactly how it should be defined and uh, had a couple comments in the, uh, the chat on that as well. So uh, Joe? Well, yeah, I was, that's what I was going to actually comment on is it seems like there's a, a different aspects of this or talk, you know, touching on three different uh, areas. And so let me see if I can try to help define them. One is uh, who's funding the pro, you know, how the programs are being funded. Are they being funded by ratepayers or by taxpayers? And that's something, you know, New York state has gone back and forth since the night, late eighties, you know, on that. And, uh, uh, you know, but conceivably, 
any of the programs that the states, a state government does, a utility could also do since really, and for the most case, state, neither the state governments or nor the utilities are actually running the programs. They're paying third parties, or I don't know whether those are the third parties we're talking about, but they pay ICF and Honeywell and others to go uh, it, to actually go implement those programs. And they're always, you know, they have some touch, the utilities and state or state governments have some touch, state energy offices. You know, it's not like they're not involved with it, but, you know, most of the actions occurring uh, by these implementers. And, uh, and most of those, uh, at least the utility programs are, so I think that the question is kind of what I'm hearing is like, there's a, there's a definitely an emphasis uh, in the empower programs on resource acquisition. Um, it's going out and giving rebates and, and trying to get people to uh, purchase more efficient equipment and less on market transformation. So I think I'm hearing that's one of the concerns is how do you get more trans market transformation or building code encouragement in the system? Because utilities, especially given the way that the goal structures are set up and potentially with a PIMS, this could get even worse, uh, is that you have uh, some incentive to not have codes uh, improve. Um, because that makes less program, gives you less program uh, opportunity. So I guess there's so I'm, I'm seeing at least three different you know areas how I could kind of scope out this this issue that we're talking about, and that is the funding, uh, the who what we mean by third party implementers, and uh, the uh, this market transformation versus resource acquisition. And on in terms of the implementers, uh, I'd be curious how people what people think about what happened with financing. Because that they're definitely different implementers for that than the utilities generally are using, right? It's not an ICF or Honeywell, uh, and it was a program that was promoted by an entity outside. You know, that's not one of the usual utility contractors. They came in, promoted that over the course of several years, uh, and finally got it through. But it's still funded. The utilities are funding it. The utilities are paying for the evaluation, um, and so would that be a I guess my, you know, is that a third, that seems like a third party uh, program to me that happened. So that's kind of a question, I guess. I mean, is that it was a long simple, way of saying, I agree, we need a def, some definitional framework here. Well, I think <laughs> somebody brought up earlier uh, that Jim, and he's going to be joining us later, um, his definition was, simple it's you know it's a third it's a program that's not run by the utilities i mean is that can we get that simple i don't i that's i think that's kind of my i don't think it's that simple because okay. what do you mean run by the program run by the utilities if run by the utilities means funded through the utilities in other words it's coming out of a surcharge ratepayer funded um then that's diff that's different than saying uh something some entity is running the program rather than the utility well the fact is the utilities aren't running the programs icf is running the programs honeyswell is running the programs um in the case of the financing you know the montgomery county you know uh i forget the names of the groups that are running that um you know so it's a different uh yeah so i think jim gravat i could i could take jim gravat's definition and uh interpret it at least at least two and i think three different ways Okay. All right. Um, Dylan and Babatuni, I know you guys have your hands up. Um, does anybody want to weigh in on what they believe is a, a good definition or definitions that we should be working under just so everyone's working off the same sheet of music? Well, I think Tunde is, is ahead of me. I, I, I can comment <laughs> on that and other things as well, but go ahead. Yes, um, so my comments is going to be um, similar to what um, Joe had said. Um, we indicated in our comments that um, it's it's important for us to have a definition um, because uh, as we've seen, it, it could be um, fairly confusing um, trying to understand what, what actually is a third party opportunity. Um, and um, it, will help, it will help to keep the conversations more focused and uh, so that everyone knows it was on the same page and we know what we are talking about. Um, I I feel like third party opportunities could um, provide a function, particularly for um, 
hard to reach areas or areas where the utilities aren't that um are aren't as um incentivized if that makes sense to 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 make investments on energy efficiency um so they could they could provide the they could provide some some level of value into the market um but i think it's important that we have a, a clear definition and we know how the costs and benefits um are, are being evaluated and um and paid for and um, we also understand um, how much funds um are coming in from the utilities or from um um or from um the customer sur surcharge um so i think it's important that we have a clear clear definition and and yeah, that, that's my contribution. All right, thanks. So we got Dylan, Julia, then Josh. Um, okay, so first on the on the definition, um, uh, I I also think that the MIA definition is, is useful, and I didn't I I think the way I read it is quite clear to to Joe's point. It does not include implementers who are hired by utilities. Um, not judging the value of those; those are you know, that's how it works. Uh, those are, those are essential. Um, but that's not, uh, I don't think that's, that's a third party program. Um, and I think the the source of fundings that, that's not, that wasn't sort of, uh, critical to, to that definition. I think we're, we're, we're generally, I assume sort of talking about empower funded. <laughs> um, there may, may be other things that were there not, but I think the question that the key part of that definition is that it's a, it's a program that's, that's not, um, managed or administered or or hired by a utility um i, I also wanted to comment quickly um just back a, a few minutes ago um lloyd make made a comment um about performance incentives sort of or what i heard was sort of performance incentives matter more and if you give the utilities a performance incentive you, should, you know that 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 can be very um very very effective uh that is uh, that's clearly what the evidence shows. And I, I think, <laughs> um, you know, th those performance, you know, having a, an, an incentive that is connected to performance in some ways makes a, a big difference. Um, that I, to my observation, the utilities have defended a non-performance based way of, of earning. And, and so I think that's, that's sort of crux of the issue um is you know how do you how are ratepayers going to to get the best performance and do they need a, a third party to do something or not i, I think is an important question but the, the sort of a, a first question is are, are we are we managing costs and getting performance um you know in the right way and then the, the last comment i wanted to make um uh, a little bit to sort of Joe asked a question about the financing programs. Is that third party? Yeah, that that's third party. That pilot is going to be managed by a third party, um, coordinated with the utilities. We we hope, um, yes, funded of Empower, but that that's clearly a third party program. And I, I it's interesting to me because <laughs> OPC spent years trying to get the utilities to develop and propose financing programs. And they they never wanted to. Um, it's less, less sort of less, a little bit less of an example, but certainly with building codes, OPC has has encouraged the utilities to develop programs around building codes or appliance standards and propose ways to um, claim savings from those, which is something that um, exist in a bunch of other states, which which gives the utilities the incentive uh, to to do that. I don't I don't I think Joe, your your concern about building codes is is a fair one, but it's it's a solvable one, and it's been solved in many many states. So I think there are absolutely have been efforts to encourage the utilities to take on some of these more transformational policies and and. Uh, or you know shift how how ratepayers are paying for these programs and and it's I think been somewhat unsatisfying and so that I think that's that's sort of you know part of the backdrop for some of this conversation. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, Julie, did you? I saw you take your hand down. Did you? So oh, yeah. 
I, yeah, I'd appreciate the opportunity to just uh, make a couple comments. So, sure. yeah, I think um, it sounds like we're probably not talking about a statewide third party administrator, um, but that would be like a Wisconsin focus on energy example where there's a third party um, that administers all of the programs uh, across the state with ratepayer funds. Um, I think that model exists or some iteration of it exists in a handful of states. I think it's worth noting, um, and this is what we put in our comments, that most of those states are moving away from that in some way, either trying to bring the utilities into the game um, through uh, like city council action in DC or um, by the commission encouraging the utilities in Wisconsin to start offering programs. And so, you know, I think OPC put in their comments a reference to Brattle's report on the kind of administrator models that exist out there. And like folks have pointed out, there's really no proven benefit to having that statewide administrator. So like, that's like one thing that I would put to the side maybe. Um, and then this question of, you know, is a third party the implementers who have contracts with the utilities or is it something else? Um, and probably for the ease of this conversation, I would agree with, I think, how Dylan just framed it of, it should be those other entities. The groups with the utility contracts are, um, you know, we're very clearly beholden to the EM and V frameworks of that the utilities are subject to beholden to cost effectiveness. And I do think that, um, any offering that's using ratepayer funds, uh, should be beholden to those same the same kind of framework um, in terms of cost effectiveness, in terms of EM and V. And the last kind of thing, well, I don't know if it's the last thing, but <laughs> that I'll put out there uh, is that there's, um, you know, with ratepayer funds, we should be thinking about like what's incremental, what wouldn't happen otherwise. And I think that's a much harder question to answer when you look um, at programs outside of the utility construct. Um, so that might be a point to make the case for kind of keeping the framework that we have. Um, and I'll give an example of, you know, if the question is like, how do we bring more um, providers into the realm of delivering and power programs you know, so like in Illinois, they have put a huge focus on serving limited income customers, but they, then that used to be a function that uh, a state agency served. Legislation moved that function into the utility realm um, and their responsibility. And what we see now is the utility, like ComEd for an example, ComEd has contracted clear result to work with community action agencies. Um, and so there is sort of this one line of accountability that goes back to the utility. Everyone's subject to the same energy efficiency framework. Um, and that's the path that they've chosen to move forward with. So the cap agencies are being brought in in a way they hadn't been before. Um, but everyone's kind of aligned on the objectives and rules that they're following. Um, and then I would just plus one to Lloyd's comment on the stacking, you know, as things become more integrated with rates and with demand response and with electric vehicles, um, you know, or you look at energy assistance programs and energy efficiency that you want to have work more closely together. I think that's another kind of reason to keep the utility kind of in the role that they're in now um, as that central provider, because they do have the ability to kind of work across all those areas. Um, 
and the relationship with that customer across all of those things. Thank you. All right, thank you, Julia. All right, bunch of hands up. We'll go Josh, Joe, Lloyd, then Dan. Uh, thank you, Honor. Again, Josh McClellan with Washington Gas. Um, I'll just I'll be brief here because I believe Dylan and and and, and both Julia have, have kind of made made a point that I was trying to get at here. Um, but I guess in a, in a different way, I think the one thing that really needs to be um, uh, taken into account when we're talking about third parties is not only just uh, the the dollars and where they're coming from, but also the accountability for the performance of any type of program that's implemented by a third party. Um, ultimately, you know, if if Washington Gas's you know prescriptive residential program is underperforming, I'm not going to bring ICF to the commission and have them explain. It's going to be ultimately my responsibility as the, as the portfolio manager. So I think that also needs to be taken into account when we're if you know when we're trying to figure out okay what is third party who is responsible for the performance of the program who funds it and those need to be very clearly spe spelled out um, in, in this conversation. So but that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Joe. Uh, it looks like Dan's hands up. I think I'll let him go first, just in case he's going to say anything I'm going to say. Okay. Well, let, let, let me jump to Lloyd then. Hi. Um, I just wanted to make one clarifying comment to my earlier comments. Um, so, yeah, the um, – because I we were t I I kind of rattled off a few thoughts on the third party thing, and in the process, I made some comments about the benefits of, of PIMS, and um, I just want to clarify um, because PIMS can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, that um, I, I I believe in uh, I believe that P PIMS are good as a as as an incentive to push utilities to be more creative and to, and to have the urgency to scale and all of that. I do not, I have found personally in places like New York and elsewhere um, through as a program manager myself, that when utilities are saddled with penalties, it does not create good behavior. So I just want to make it sure that when I say PIMS, I really mean um, incentives for focusing on the policy objectives that are laid out by the commission um and you know there and it comes with a, obviously to my earlier points having a single third party um and until julia's points things rolling up to a single third party for accountability and simplicity and everything else um isn't my view the way to go all right thank you very much sir uh dan thank you um i guess I'm thinking about this definition of third party, and I would, you know, my initial reaction instinct is that it should not, they should be outside the Empower surcharge. They should not be funded through Empower. If the idea is to try to move programs out of the utility realm to lower our surcharge, but still get some kind of benefits, I don't see why we would have a surcharge funded third party. Um, point number two, kind of generally thinking out here is, you know, we do have, you know, competitive markets for electricity supply and gas supply. And I think we're, uh, you know, I'm not sure there's a whole lot of trust out there in these third party suppliers. Uh, I think around 20% of customers are with suppliers. The commission has recently really taken strong actions over the last, you know, 12 to 18 months as far as fining, suspending licenses for bad actors. Um, so I, I there's there's some concern there uh, with a third party to make sure they're vetted properly. They're not going to be trying to take advantage of of the customers out there. Um, others already talked about the EMV and and uh, who's responsible, so I won't touch on those. And I guess I guess you know stepping back, you know, we we had these programs back, you know, 2006. You know, we had utilities coming off rate caps. We had severe rate increases. We had PGM coming in in the summer of 2006 or seven, saying we're going to have blackouts in 2011. Maryland doesn't do something, so we, you know, kind of had to get these programs started. To you know, obviously the people weren't going out on their own and buying these high efficiency equipment. Well, not not everybody, but a majority of folks weren't going out 
buying high efficiency equipment for their for their homes and businesses. So we had to put these programs together to incent uh, those customers to um, go out and 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 make our make those changes and and have the state achieve the goals that we've achieved over the last 15 years. You know, we have consistently met our goals uh, with Empower. Um, but uh, yeah, just my first point, I think the third party, I, I'm thinking that we're, if we're moving stuff out of impact, out of the utility, out of the search, it should be moved out of the surcharge. So that's, that's kind of my initial thought on this third party definition. Thanks. Hey, Dan, before you go, um, so if you move it out of the surcharge, how, how would the funding work for those third parties that don't have a connection with utilities? I think it would have to be a competitive market and they'd have to sell their services on their own. Okay. All right. Uh, Josh, you saw your hand up, sir. Is that just a residual? Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, it's all right. Uh, Nicole and then Scott. Oh, Judge, I was still, I didn't want to get out of the queue. Oh. Oh, okay. All right. This is Joe. Fine. Go ahead. Joe, Nicole, and Scott. Yeah, I wanted to go after Dan. Um, so uh, uh, what I'm hearing, uh, I'm, still, I'm still a little confused on the definition, but you know, it takes me longer than most people. Um, but if we're not talking third-party administration and, you know, a state funding kind of model, uh, then, and, and financing this per, you know, Dylan's comments that the financing program is an example of third party. So I'll call it our third party success story, although it remains to be seen how successful it is, but, um, we'll call it a, a third party success story in the, in the sense that it got through the process. And as we said, it was vetted for a couple of years. Um, I think there was, I don't think the utilities were particularly enthusiastic about it, but their questions were. The same questions that were being asked in every other jurisdiction where this has come up you know who's gonna how are you gonna get your money back and how are you gonna emv it and um you know it was all the uh, the whole discussion was all discussion that i think i've heard for at least 10 years and so it was a, it was just a vetting process uh, that it went through and i would uh, i know uh i think dylan you said that the utilities were against pims i have a different experience from discussions i don't know eight or nine years ago or something in Maryland uh, on PIMS where I chat, you know, everybody was kind of getting warm and fuzzy around PIMS. And I started questioning the EMV uh, uh, feasibility, the feasibility in the context of EMV. And I had some utilities mad at me. Um, and so, you know, that suggests to me that at least, at least way back when uh, that the uh, uh, utilities were, uh, uh, you know, not opposed to, uh, PIMS, and I have not heard any communications that they are opposed to PIMS. So I'm, I'm curious where that where that's coming from. And in terms of codes and standards, we have actually had discussion of that within, the, I'd say, the last five years or something, at least in the, you know, amongst the EAG type, you know, people. So this was, I don't think this was in a work group necessarily. Um, and the challenge uh, with that, uh, the reason we kind of step back from it is that market that Maryland has for many, for a couple decades now, uh, adopted the model energy code as it is determined by DOE. Determined means approved uh, by uh, DOE, the Depart U.S. Department of Energy. And it, I think Maryland uh, makes it effective within a year or something after that determination is made. And so it was, you know, as a question of, well, how are the, how would the utilities go about driving a more aggressive uh, code? Or were we suggesting that they go beyond the model energy code? I don't, I didn't hear anyone proposing that. Uh, and then there were uh, questions about, well, then how, you know, how, you know, what have you, what have, what have the utilities really done to drive that code? Uh, and to what extent, you know, actually if, uh, so then there was arguments, well, if the utilities are involved with uh, the DOE determinations and, and, and getting the model energy code accepted at the national level, knowing that it will be adopted at the state level, then that would be a, a groovy thing that the utilities can contribute to. But uh, my argument or challenge in that was, you know, I've seen, I've been in many of those kind of uh, venues and stakeholders can go in and they can say things that undermine uh, model the codes or uh, can increase or make them more aggressive or less aggressive. So just participating uh, in a code does not, uh, in a code hearing or code, you know, process uh, does not mean that you've driven uh, 
uh, driven the code. And so, so I, I guess I kind of, I still got to come back to my original question. And that is what's, where's our problem here? Uh, what are, do we have specific examples of what we'll call, anybody can, third party proposals defined however you want to define them that have not made it through the process and through our current, you know, empower process. And so what are they? And then maybe we could pick apart, well, what broke down? What happened so that those third party proposals didn't make it through the process? And then we can figure out how to fix it. Because my perception, and I've been in this business a long time, I love energy efficiency. If anybody, I hope nobody's questioning that, even though sometimes I know people do. But I, uh, what my perception is that everyone says, oh, the utilities need to be going to do more program, need more program designs, need there are all this groovy stuff out there that people need to be doing. And then we get into hearings and nobody's, there's a, a list of things that are kind of nibbling on the edges and uh, certainly not game changers that are going to replace lighting. Um, and so we end up, you know, so people, the utilities amp up their behavioral programs. They start throwing in CVR, doing everything they can to try to, uh, uh, make up the difference. Um, you know, but you know, it's, I just, my experience is not in Maryland that the utilities have any incentive, nor have they in fact been, uh, trying not to do a new program. And I love to criticize the utilities. So I'm not trying, don't, don't brand me as a defender of the utilities here. Um, but I just, it's not my experience in all the hearings I've been in for, you know, 12 years here. All right. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Nicole. Well, yes, Your Honor. Nicole Zeichner on behalf of OPC. Um, in terms of what we're trying to fix, we, in our comments, OPC in our comments laid out some prerequisites to the top energy forming energy efficiency performing programs. And I think that's something we could start with, trying to, to fix those particular problems and make Maryland more compatib compatible with the top energy efficiency jurisdictions and see if those items can be fixed with the current utility administered programs or whether there's an opportunity for third party involvement. And some of those are just generally So having a stronger energy efficiency standard and required savings target targets, and these are in comments, I don't want to make everyone listen to these again, but I think that that's what we're trying, I think in terms of what we're trying to fix right now, I would say let's focus on those goals that we know lead to more efficient jurisdictions and then see where we go from there. Thank maybe you. not fix, maybe try and enhance. Yes, better? rather try and enhance, and, and that's a start. And if those those items can't be enhanced through yeah. utility-administered programs, maybe there's an opportunity for third parties. And and also, we, we don't believe that the idea of full third-party administration is off the table. I, I don't think that, I think we would disagree that other states are moving away from that. I think that could still be on the table, depending on what we find as we try to enhance our programs. That'd be a pretty radical change, though, would it not? You would it agree it with would. That? It yeah. would. And we're not suggesting that at this point. Sure. We're just I'm saying sure. it's, it's something that could be kept on the table if needed. Right. Did you have any thoughts on, um, you know, Dan was talking about moving, if a third third party, no connection to the utility, uh, were to get, you know, a program, should that be outside of the surcharge or should they be paid through the surcharge? Your Honor, I'm not equipped to answer that at this time. That's I'd have to fine. think about that further. Thank that, that, you. That, that's fine. I just wanted to see if anybody wanted to weigh in. Scott. Good morning. So I'll try to help answer one of Joe's questions, which may or may not be beneficial at all. But regarding codes in Maryland, um, Maryland adopts new codes every March of every code year. Um, so whenever a new code comes out, the state automatically adopts it. You know, it's March or April, but it's no later than April. And then it requires every county in the state to adopt the new code as well. Um, but they don't enforce it, which means, you know, the codes aren't necessarily followed, um, you know, throughout the state. If state funding, if somebody comes to DHCD and wants to do a project through DHCD, they're required to design that project to the current the current codes, whether it's energy or building or electric or whatever. Um, if they're seeking state funding, then they they have to follow the code anyway as, as part of their application process. Um, so the, the next 
item. I think based on Jim's definition, DHCD would be a third party administer, uh, administrator. Um, you know, we, we don't, we don't, um, we're not a utility. We don't contract with the utility. I'm sorry, we do contract with the utilities, but we get our authorization to do the, the program through the PSC. And um, with this discussion and, you know, with the likelihood of a, a low income goal coming down the road, um, you know, we, we find ourselves in a similar situation, you know, that the utilities have with us and have had with the past and find that, you know, having a having a, another implementer do programs that are similar to what we would be doing would be difficult. Um, it'd be difficult to coordinate similar similar to the challenges that that the utilities have with us and we have the utilities when we talk about trying to get to the low income customers and utilities should have some some responsibility for low income and and um, DCD should have you know probably likely the the majority of responsibility for for reaching the goals if if not all of it um, I think what works with the design we have now is the utilities get to focus on the area that that they know and and do really well, and they have a difficulty with low income because it's hard to identify their low income customers. Whereas with DHCD, you know, our business is is low income. Um, we have easier access and 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 greater access to low income. So having that line between kind of market rate and low income. I think works for the design that we have. Um, if we start to give programs to third parties, and I understand that the concept is to not compete with the programs, um, or if they can do it more cost effectively or efficiently, maybe they are competing with them. But I think to Dan's point earlier, and, and I think, you know, to Lori's and, and the concern with the utilities and what will be a concern with DHCD is there will be competition. There will be overlap. Um, I think it's almost unavoidable. We're, we already see that with the programs between DHCD and, and the utilities. Um, how does it play into or how does it go against the goal that the utilities or DHCD is trying to get? And how do you coordinate those efforts? I can see where if a if an implementer um, is trying to get to low income customers that DHCD is not getting to, I can see the the benefit of having somebody do that. But I think it it works better if they work. I'll loosely say in coordination with, but maybe as a contractor with DHCD. Um, same principle with you know, ICF or Honeywell with the utilities. Um, that specialty is 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 working under, you know, DHCD or the utilities to achieve the specific purpose of their specialty. But then, um, you know, DHCD or the utility is responsible for their results. Similar to, as, as Josh was saying, um, if ICF underperforms, you know, Josh is responsible. Washington Gas is responsible for their their results. Um, if in in Josh's case, if DHCD underperforms for for low income, um, you know we're responsible for for Washington Gas, but Washington Gas is responsible for us. Um, and that's that can be a difficult position, but that's what happens when you have that contractual obligation. So I think kind of my long winded story is. Um, not here to, to kind of express policy, but from an administrator's, you know, position to add other administrators in to do the same thing that you're doing to everybody, to, to some people's points, building layers on of responsibility of EMV of administration, um, crossover with, with customers, it starts to get complicated. And I think unnecessarily complicated where um you know having just you know the primary administrators 
um, utilizing those specialties to get to the areas that um, may not be gotten to currently. All right, All right. thanks, Scott. Um, Mr. Gravatt, you've joined us. I have, Your Honor. Were your ears burning? <laughs> Just a little bit. Um, Jim Gravatt, on behalf of the Energy Advocates, my apologies for joining so late this morning. They needed me in the Carolinas, and I, I, it's hard to choose between states, but but I, I wanted to be here, and I, I hope I was here in spirit. Um, so also apologies if, I, if I, I've missed enough of the conversation that what I'm going to say is off base. Um, first of all, Scott, I actually was not thinking of DHCV as a third party in the definition that I floated out there. Um, I don't, you know, the fact that DHCD was appointed by the commission instead of selected through an RFP process by the utilities to implement the energy efficiency programs. I still sort of look at you as a program implementation vendor. Uh, you just happen to be a branch of state government. Um, I, from the, the conversation that I'm hearing, it, it sort of feels a little bit like third party and everybody went, oh, no, no, everything's fine. We don't need third parties. They're going to mess everything up. And, you know, I, I tried in, in the language that I put about third parties to make it be pretty narrow uh, and to say there, there, there shouldn't be a role for third parties unless they're going to either achieve savings in markets the utilities have not been successful in to date, or if they're going to be able to provide savings, you know, consistent with the goals more effectively, uh, or perhaps for, you know, disadvantaged markets where the utilities and DHCD haven't been successful. And, and I kind of view that as a pretty high bar. So it, it's, I'm certainly not suggesting we should open this up and, you know, and I understand that why people might react that way, because I think others probably in Maryland, certainly in other states, have suggested that we should have competition for energy efficiency programs. Let's make it be a free market. Let's have it be the Wild West. And everybody's out there trying to poach savings from each other. I'm not suggesting that at all. But, you know, I'm kind of reminded, when I look at the joint utilities response a little bit, it's like, we have a system that works. We've got this. We win awards. Everything's good. Don't mess with it. And, and, and I'm thinking about when I used to be in management uh, back at VEIC and I had a team of 30 and my approach to hiring was always to hire people who were smarter than me, more creative than me, harder working than me and let them shine. So, you know, the parallel there I think is utilities, you're doing a great job. DHCD, you're doing a great job. But if there are people out there or companies out there or municipalities who have ideas that would benefit empower and i'm thinking again we're going to have pretty aggressive goals here they're going to be hard to achieve so if there are things that third parties can do to help achieve those we should be open to that and create room for that to happen i know we have a process now and i agree with opc i, I think it's flawed um, you know i worked a little bit with sierra club and uh, some of the other advocates to present a proposal the last time I, you know we put a fair amount of work into it I thought it was a good presentation. I thought it was a valid approach. And, you know, the response was, no, we don't think this is going to work for us right now. And I understand utilities had some reasons for that. But again, in that context, kind of the utilities and to some extent, perhaps staff advising are making the decisions. And I'm, and I'm not sure that the process is perfect as it is. I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, you know, to O'Power's comments, I mean, I think plausibly, in the early days, I mean, I was managing a residential for efficiency Vermont before O-Power had a single utility customer. And Alex came to me and said, we want to do this behavior thing that we're cooking up. Nobody else has done it. We've been doing all this research. We think it's going to get a lot of savings. And, you know, at that point in time, I think O-Power plausibly could have been a third party implementer with new technology and new program ideas that nobody else was doing and that could have fit in this bill, you know, or in this, in this realm. So that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. But I, I also, just sorry, <laughs> one more thing I'm gonna say. Now, there was a process in Illinois, and I think it was not a great process. I think it was a little cumbersome, 
but there were statutory savings goals and, and all this is now in the past because the statutes have been revised. Statutory savings goals, and Julia, I'm sure you probably know more about this than I do. Statutory savings goals and a budget cap. We, and the budget cap did not allow the utilities to achieve all the savings that were cost effective. So this workaround got invented that was pretty cumbersome, but where third parties could propose programs. And while, while it was a time consuming process, I think it was a very well run process where uh, kind of all the stakeholders would have a blind review of the proposals and make comments. And there was a bar that had to be passed in order for the programs to, um, to move forward. And that meant you know, they couldn't compete with utility programs. They couldn't be going out and poaching the same customers. It had to be getting at something that wasn't already being reached by the utilities. So I think there are ways to do it. Uh, and, and I would just say, let's not just toss it out because again, if there's somebody smarter out there who can help us get or help the utilities and the ACD get to where they're trying to get to in, in a meaningful way, let's, let's listen to that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Don't, don't go anywhere, sir. Uh, I mean, we, we, we couldn't even d decide, uh, you know, we, we were talking about your definition. We still have yet to the, actually decide what a third party is here. I think we're getting closer, but um, how would you see a, a, a true third party, someone that's not connected with the HCD, not connected with the utilities, how would you see them, how would you see them being compensated? What's the funding mechanism? Is that part of the surcharge? Is it something different? Yes, thank you. My initial thought is it probably would be part of the surcharge. Um, I wouldn't want to rule out the possibility that somebody had some other mechanism. For example, uh, there are costs associated with unbill refinancing or unbill repayment, unbill financing. Uh, there's some costs associated with that, but you know, a lot, a lot of it is supposed to be sort of self-funding. Um, there may be other types of programs, specifically I'm thinking technology focused, that may not, it, maybe they require some startup funds and then maybe there, there's not an ongoing cost. I, I don't know, but I wouldn't want to close that out. But my, my general sense is if some third party, let's say a municipality is doing something, maybe it's just a marketing effort that generates more participation for existing utility programs. I don't know what it is. But I would think that would be funded through the surcharge, through con some contractual arrangement with utilities, probably, or DHCD. And also, I kind of go back to uh, what we had in the goals framework, which said that anything that's going to count towards the Empower Savings Goal is going to go through EMNV. So that would have to somehow be reflected. There would have to be some relationship that will ensure that that EMNV could occur. Sure. And then does the goal have to get adjusted? somewhat the utilities goal if they've got a third party true third party where they don't have any control over them does again th th this is just stuff that we've kind of hit on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thinking on my feet here um you know we've we've had this conversation around dhcd in the past and the advocates have steadfastly said and agreed with the utilities that the utility should not be accountable for whether DHCD is going to meet their goals or not. So I, I kind of think it depends on what the third party arrangement is. If it's really, a, you know, um, let's think of a, a Con Ed example in New York State. Con Ed hired, uh, had some areas that were geographically constrained. Distribution system was maxing out probably because of, you know, low growth, customer growth. And so they issued some RFPs for parties to come in and get more savings in those areas to defer the load growth. And they had contracts, so they, it was contracted through Con Ed, but there were very significant performance uh, penalties. You know, if, if the contractor, if the third party didn't reach their goals, they got hit pretty hard financially. Um, you know, so models like that, to me, make sense. I think I put in uh, my comments on third parties that they should be performance-based. Um, I think I remember that. 
Um, but I think it's a good idea. It's a good way to do it. All right. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, Josh and then Scott. Uh, thanks, Your Honor. Uh, again, Josh McClellan with Washington Gas. And uh, this is more of a question or a comment uh, towards uh, what uh, what Jim just kind of just briefly touched on here. Um, you know, I, I think one concern I have personally, I'm not speaking on behalf of uh, the joint utilities, but just from my perspective, as we're talking about third parties, there's a lot of speak of may, might, should, you know, we're, we're very much in the realm of the art of the possible right now. And I understand that there is a place to have those discussions in this work group, and I think it's important. But I think, you know, if we're really trying to nail down some specific things about third parties, um, I, I want to just know, and you know, I, 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 Jim, I want to broach the same question to you that I did with the cold over OPC is, are you aware of any real world outcomes where a third party did in fact say what we think is what we're trying to accomplish here and uh, reaching certain markets, reaching certain demographics, doing certain things that the utilities either have historically not been able to do or have underperformed. Um, I'd like to go back to your example where, you know, this cumbersome process was put in place I can only assume that what you mean by cumbersome is pretty long, drawn out, complex, and probably expensive. But I want to know, were there any results from that process? Was it successful? Uh, did the commission or, you know, the, you know, the regulators, did, 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 were those third parties found? And when they were found, were they able to achieve what, you know, that whole process was, you know, set up to do? So I, I guess I'm, I think it'd just be helpful if there were some real world experiences or just examples that we could lean on a little bit here to see if, you know, if we can add a little bit more substance to this third party and, and what we, we would want to try to accomplish with having a larger third party presence in Empower Maryland. So if I may answer, Jim Gravatt on behalf of the Energy Ad Advocates, and the answer is yes, Josh. Uh, there were vendors who were selected through that process uh, who, who launched programs. Um, now, what happened eventually in Illinois is that the statute was reframed and the budget cap was eliminated and the savings goals were made much higher. Um, and I think it all came under the utility umbrella. Um, I, I think in part, you know, one, clearly from the utilities comments about legislation and funding and rate impacts and so forth, you know, different parties are going to have different perspectives on what the right savings target is going to end up being. We haven't really even broached that. Um, I'm going to assume it's going to be really high and really hard to achieve. So again, I just think we should keep that door open uh, for, for the potential of third parties. I believe that there probably are examples. I think that we could look at um, the Better Buildings Program. Uh, and I, I don't have uh, the answer for you right off the top of my head, Josh, it, um, but there was a pretty comprehensive evaluation done of that program. And, and these were a lot of federally funded community-based programs that went out and tried to get savings. I, I think there may be models in there that municipalities or, or others might follow um, that don't fit strictly sort of under the sort of the control that utilities are accustomed to having with implementation contractors that they hire that, that I just wouldn't discard at this point. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. All right, Scott and then Julia. Good morning, Scott. Bobby do you need so, Jim, I, I wanted to just drop that, that I don't disagree with um, with the thoughts fundamentally, but um, you had a couple kind of key words that I think maybe would help with clarification. Um, if so, actually, I want to use the example you used of a munis municipality trying to um, maybe being a third party implementer to better market you know, for their, for their locality to bring um, participants or applications to the program. Um, I think that's a, it's a perfect example. It's a perfect example, you know, at least under our programs where it, it could give us better reach into the market. And that was actually one of the things that I was thinking about too, based on the comments that we got, 
Um, would if we're seeking to do that, or if that's part of the the program, you know, the the um, emphasis of the program to try to to reach those goals. If we were to contract with that municipality, would they then be a third party implementer, or are they, you know, a vendor or contractor of the administrator who is doing this function for for DHCD? Um, would they still then be considered a, a third party? I'm I'm interested to hear what you think about that. Uh, again, Jim Gravatt on behalf of the efficiency advocates and making this up as I go. Uh, in my view, if we're looking at an ICF, uh, an Oracle, uh, a Honeywell, a clear result, these are businesses that whose business model is to run energy efficiency programs. And I think of them as implementation contractors or vendors. If we're looking at a municipal government, they have a different business. <laughs> They're doing a lot of other things, but if they have local goals that can work in conjunction with empower goals to advance both, you know, and even in the scenario where uh, a utility was contracting with using empower surcharge funds, contracting with a municipality or uh, some not, let's say a nonprofit uh, housing organization, for example, um, I, I would think that's a third party. It's not their, it's not their business model. They're, it's not what they're primarily doing, but it's consistent with some of their goals and they have uh, specific access to customers and savings that can help uh, empower reach its goals. And I, I do just want to say, I'm making this up as I go here a little bit. So uh, let's think about, you know, is everything I'm putting out here is a, is a, it's a hypothesis for discussion. It's not a etched in stone. I didn't bring my chisels today. Right, very good. Uh, Julia, you had your hand up earlier. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Sure. Um, just to put a little bit more context around Jim's uh, Illinois example, and uh, Josh, I can appreciate wanting real world examples of what we're talking about. So the Illinois Power Agency's role um, for procuring those additional savings changed, as Jim said, with the legislation in 2016. And not only did their role change, the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity in Illinois had been responsible for uh, serving public sector customers with energy efficiency, as well as limited income customers. And all of that, the power agencies, third party procurement, public uh, sector energy efficiency and limited income all went under the utilities when the legislation changed. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that the utilities goals were in that legislation were getting a lot higher and they were putting performance incentives uh, in place. And so it is definitely hard to think about these things, um, not as like one holistic kind of package and the implication that one has on the other. Um, you know, we have talked about we like briefly touched on pins this morning. We've talked about um, goal structure uh, in the past. And so um, certainly I think that should inform how we think about the role of third parties. I would also, I mean, I would support Joe's comment earlier about, you know, what are we trying to solve? And I do think it's important. We obviously can't anticipate like everything, but um, you know, there are market models. Someone raised earlier, you know, market transformation is something they see the utilities struggling with. And there are models um, for addressing that. In the Midwest, the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance uh, has created a sort of utility collaborative um, for market transformation that is 
part of each of the utilities um, DSM portfolio. And in the same way that they, the utilities have put uh, building energy code enforcement um, into their DSM portfolios. So I think those things can be solved for, um, you know, if we know it. And then I think, you know, if there's other barriers to, uh, you know, new actors coming in, I think that like, and working with the utilities. So in Illinois, an issue that was raised was sort of, you know, the utility contracting process is very difficult and requires a decent amount of expertise. And so that's something that, you know, a group just like this one has been working on to address, like, how can we give support to some of the smaller um, implementers or, you know, non-energy efficiency businesses who would want to participate to be able to contract with a utility. Um, and so, you know, again, there are ways to address this um, without sort of, uh, while still like working with the utility as that central actor, I think is, yeah, the point that I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Joe. Joe, you with us? Yes. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, so I think we have at least one specific example of uh, of a third of, of something that people are recognizing as a third party uh, imp implementation, um, and that's the financing. And so that took a few years to get through, but ultimately it got through. And I think it was a consensus recommendation to the commission or close to it. Um, nevertheless, it is underway. Um, we had a, uh, so I, I'm trying to think of specific examples that we could hone in on uh, now or later to think about uh, where the where the challenges are, where things are breaking down. Um, so that would be one just to go maybe debrief on that. Um, a second we had, I know in the last program cycle, I can't remember who it was, but it was a specific entity organization that was promoting uh, code enforcement and compliance program. Um, and uh, that, you know, got some got some hearing, but I don't think it was taken up in any of the uh, program plans, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Uh, and I know there were some pretty serious. I know I had some serious questions uh, around it, at least, and I think others probably, but that would be another one. Go look at it, see what the questions were. Were the questions not addressed or not discussed fully, or did it not get the the vetting uh, and airing that it deserved, that particular proposal for code enforcement? Um, another is, you know, I don't, I haven't heard or any, ESCO, you know, there's a lot of companies out there uh, that are not program implementers, that are not ICFs, uh, you know, uh, that are out there doing performance contracts. Um, in fact, Honeywell, who's an implementer in Maryland, uh, is a big performance contractor. And so I guess a question would be whether that's a, you know, a model that presents opportunity to Maryland that is somehow not being, uh, you know, exploited. And I, I assume that those ESCOs are already participating in the programs to the extent that they are taking their customers are taking advantage of the incentives and that's all written into their performance contracts. Um, so I would assume that that's just a, you know, a, a large extent already happening uh, to the extent those are incentives are available. I'm sure uh, that the ESCOs are taking or availing themselves of them. Um, but that would be another one. Is, is, there, is, there, is there some sort of barrier to ESCO participation or performance contract, you know, a private sector performance contract participation, uh, the model kind of like a, a, I think Dan is speaking to and then finally on the municipal the municipalities jim oh well no actually too so jim you've mentioned municipalities a couple of times so i'm just wondering if there's if you have something specific in mind and you also said that there was something that you had proposed that you felt like didn't get a hearing and i didn't know whether that was the is that the limited income goal or were you talking about something else that didn't get a fair hearing I can answer, Your Honor. I, I, I don't know that I felt it didn't get a fair hearing. I just felt that it was rejected. Um, no. But that's the and, limit and you're talking about. Maybe, income. Jim? No, no. Oh. 
Uh, I'm not actually. I'm talking about a uh, fuel switching program. Okay. Um, and it, I mean, perhaps it was fairly rejected because it was not uh, viewed as consistent with the goals that were in place at that time. Um, um, but yeah, I think the ESCO question is a good one, Joe. How about the municipalities? Is there a specific, are you thinking of some specific things from the municipalities that could be coming in if the door was opened? Or is it just, you're talking hypothetically at this point? Um, mostly hypothetically, but you know, we certainly know that Montgomery County uh, is pretty involved in Empower and in, uh, there are a lot of jurisdictions around the country that are um, passing ordinances and trying to uh, become climate neutral and uh, and you know, make a lot of headway on climate goals. So uh, it seems reasonable to think that there could be municipalities who who might have something to offer. And I, I know there's been some discussion about the unique trust relationship that utilities have with their customers. Absolutely. But some municipalities also have that as well. Uh, utilities do not have a corner on the market, the only entity in the world who uh, individual customers may trust. Uh, I just have to say, for those of you who don't remember, there was a time when Pepco was the most hated company in America. I saw this on national news when I was on the treadmill at the Y in Burlington, Vermont. So, and kudos to Pepco for changing that, but there are other entities that people have trust with. Uh, Lindsay. Hi everyone, Lindsay Shaw with Montgomery County, one of the jurisdictions participating in this group. Um, I know that uh, Prince George's County is also uh, hanging around in the attendee list. Uh, so to answer Joe's questions, um, so there are activities that the county does at a local level uh, that are not replicated in the current utility programming. So I think that the concept of municipalities participating in the Empower Maryland program really stems from the fact that um, we're not trying to offer competing um, programs, but we do have existing programs or programs that could be enhanced with Empower funding to have a deeper reach with certain uh, segments of the population that utilities haven't been successful in uh, reaching to um, Jim's points in uh, his comments for the energy advocates. Um, I, I think that there's a number of things that are happening at the local level that the utilities could benefit from. And one of the things that I really appreciated in Jim's comments were we have the ability to do test bedding of new ideas that the utilities might have a little bit too much of a, a focus and a spotlight on them and, and regulatory practices around their Empower activities that having a like an innovation carve out or some portion of Empower funds to try out new things without having to do burdensome reporting, you know, reporting every move that's made, there's an opportunity there to you know, generate generate some data, generate um, some engagement, and have that be a funnel for a potential Empower program in the future that is utility operated. But we do have, I would say, I wouldn't say a deeper trust level, but potentially a different way of looking at trust with residents uh, and businesses in Montgomery County or Prince George's County that they might look to the local government we have the Montgomery Energy Connection Program that was um, established with Pepco Exelon merger funding, which has become this comprehensive resource for energy efficiency information and renewable energy information in Montgomery County for county residents. But we're interacting with people that have said, I had no idea I was paying an Empower Maryland surcharge. I had no idea about these programs. So through the Energy Connection Programming, we're, we're developing innovative partnerships with businesses across the country. February is coming up, which is also February. Um, so we're partnering with Maryland-based uh, breweries, talking to people that may not even be thinking about their utility bill, but we're getting, getting an opportunity to talk to them about the Empower Maryland programs, the quick home energy checkups, the home performance with Energy Star audits, and we're also giving them free LED light bulbs. So uh, just saying that there's other ways of thinking about energy efficiency engagement rather than just utility programming. And I think that we have a real opportunity here to broaden the innovation 
of what this program can do and serve as that test bed. So I'll, I know other people have their hands up, but I just want to um, highlight Jim's point that there is an opportunity here to grow new programming and make sure that Maryland stays in that you know, number six or goes for a higher level number on the ACEEE state scorecard, there's opportunity there. And, you know, we'd like to, to help support that program. So I'll leave it open for others to chat or respond. All right, thank you very much, Lindsay. I know I can certainly get behind um, your, your, your brewery idea. I'm sure there's <laughs> probably a lot of folks that could uh, I'll, would echo I'll put, that. I'll put some info in the chat, Your Honor. <laughs> Okay, um, we got Taylor and Josh, and we got a couple more after that. Good morning, everyone. Taylor Beckham from PHI. Um, I wanted to just kind of ask a question or based off of some of the points that, Lindsay, you made, and thank you for your comments. Um, one thing is, you know, we're using ratepayer funding to um, fund the Empower program, and um, you mentioned using a carve out of that funding towards programs that the municipality would um, administer or run. I guess the question is, you know, given that the municipality also has the benefit of receiving taxpayer funds, um, is there sort of a double fund or a double payment there by the customers? Um, so it just would want to think through that. And you did mention about the um, funding that Montgomery County and I think PG County also received through the merger um, commitments and um, PHI I think has been in compliance with all of those commitments. So I would just ask if there's any reporting, I know you, you said, you know, the value of a municipality is that they're not subject to the same sort of reporting requirements that the utilities are with the commission, but in this instance with the program that Montgomery County um, has been um, running, do you have any reporting or metrics or anything that shows, you know, the success or, um, you know, how that program has actually impacted or benefited those Montgomery County residents? residents? It's a great question. Um, we do uh, have some informal uh, reporting. We put out kind of a how many residents we've engaged in, how many uh, light bulbs we've recycled at the Montgomery County Transfer Station, uh, you know, taking CFLs out of the waste stream because they have mercury in them. They shouldn't be thrown away if anyone didn't know that. I feel like this group would know that, but um, taking CFLs out of the waste stream and recycling them properly um, and getting incandescents out of out of homes in, you know, in addition to the other work, it's kind of a, a, um, a teaser for what the QHEC program is. So we're kind of getting people excited in different areas of the county. Um, and we've gotten, you know, we're upwards of 20,000 residents engaged since the start of this program. So um, I'm happy to, to provide um, more concrete numbers, but we do track, you know, number of light bulbs, number of engagements, you know, digital and in person. So, um, you know, we've had, had some good success there. Um, but I would just say that the one benefit there, the add on, the, um, the real focus of this is that we're developing partnerships that are, I would say, unlikely so that we're able to really reach residents that might not be looking at their utility bill, might not know about the Empower Maryland program. And it's really, you know, sparking an interest in something that they might not have normally um, engaged in. So, um, yeah, happy to, to follow up with uh, more detailed engagement information. But um, per the order, Montgomery County didn't necessarily have strict reporting requirements around the uh, Pepco Exelon funding. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Josh and then Nicole. Thank you, Honor. Again, Josh McClellan with Washington Gas. Um, I think Lindsay hit on a very, very important point here. Uh, first of all, you're definitely speaking my love language with uh, February, so I'll have to check up the Montgomery County here uh, next month and check those out. <laughs> but uh, but um, I think what's, what's, what's going on here is um, there's this notion that third parties need to be a part of it because um, they're going to fill in gaps and deficiencies of the utilities. And, you know, they, you know basically they may saying, hey, the utilities have been shown to not do this one thing very well. And there might be an other entity that might be able to do that thing better. The thing is, though, is when you start including, okay, accountability of goals through Empower, if you're using Empower ratepayer surcharge funds, you know, and, and you know, if so let's, let's say, let's use a hypothetical example here where, hey, um, Montgomery County and the Department of Environment um, are, you know, want to 
use Empower Surcharge funding for this one program to help achieve Empower goals, right? Um, that automatically puts you in the same realm as DHCD. You just happen to be a state agency and we have very similar aligned goals. But once you use surcharge funding and once you, you, you're under the Empower umbrella, you're a third party implementer, not a fully independent third party. So the point I'm trying to make here is that if the utilities are going to be looked upon to be responsible for achieving the majority, if not all of the goals under Empower Maryland, and they're going to be held accountable for the performance of, you know, reducing greenhouse gases and, and, and energy reduction, then most of the programs and responsibilities and all the people that are doing that work should be funneled through the utilities. If they're ultimately going to be, you know, the, 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 the party responsible for achieving those goals. And so instead of trying to just spot deficiencies in what the utilities are doing and farm it out to someone else and hope that they might be able to do a better job. Um, I think another point that Julie brought up earlier as well is it's not so much that someone else could do it better. There might just be a better system to operate under. There might be more tools and resources that the utilities could leverage and take advantage of to help achieve those goals. Um, I think a great example is the partnership we have in Montgomery County right now. There is a collaborative engagement with the county. You know, I've spoken with Lindsay on, on multiple occasions on trying to promote and uplift Empower Maryland, both gas and electric, all the various programs, because it's a complementary symbiotic relationship, right? They're trying to achieve their own county goals. We're trying to achieve the Empower Maryland goals. And so instead of trying to figure out, okay, who's responsible for what and try to farm out responsibility to someone else other than utilities, let's just give the utilities the tools and the resources and, you know, and then the, the engagement and the collaboration and whatever elements that we need to help achieve those goals. Because I, I think that's kind of, you know, the notion that needs to be kind of taken here. So thanks. So Josh, just to follow up if I can. So you're not necessarily opposed to working with the county, but it would just be more or less the county getting paid directly or get, getting empower funds directly. Is that fair to say? No, no, we're, no I'm, I'm not opposed to working with the county at all. Right. I just think, um, you know, it, it depends on the re relationship that we would want to um, build with the county. If Montgomery County is looking to use Empower Maryland funding and then is therefore responsible for, you know, a certain portion of the energy savings or greenhouse ga gas abatement goals that are under Empower, then that kind of moves them into a different category, similar to the relationship we have with DHCD. Agreed. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and Lindsay, is that kind of what you're talking about or is it something different? Um, you know, I'm, I don't have a fully baked concept in mind. I did want to okay. bring this to the group for discussion, but I think that jo Josh brought up something that I was typing the chat, um, but I, um, I'm going to delete that now. Um, Josh, you had said, you know, if the utilities are 100% on the hook for achieving the Empower goals, you know, then we need to be a partner with the utilities and potentially in like almost a subcontractor role, in which case we would then become a, a third party administrator. But I think that that's the concept that we're really talking about. Should the utilities be 100% on the hook for meeting all of the Empower goals? What if some of that burden was shared so that you know, yes, ICF is your contractor. ICF isn't going to go in front of the commission, Washington Gas or the other utilities would. Um, but what's to say that if local jurisdictions got a carve out of innovation and power funding, that we wouldn't have to go in front of the PSC? Why is it 100% falling on the utility shoulders there? So just, just a concept to throw out there. But um, thanks, Judge, for All right. The Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Um, uh, Your Honor, I, I just please. a very quick response again. This is Josh again. Um, no, I think that's a great point. And I, I, you know, I don't think, you know, no one would be adamantly opposed to, to something along those lines. But, you know, there's checks and balances already in place with the current system that we have. So, um, I, you know, so if under that hypothetical situation, if Montgomery County is doing a certain carve out, is tasked and has a goal and objective and using power funding, and you're underperforming and you're not hitting the goals or things just aren't panning out the way you want, how does that look? You know, Ed, so it's, it's utility rate payer funds that are being funneled into this program. We have a contractual relationship 
with Montgomery County to basically do some, of, you know, achieve some of these tasks and objectives and goals. So what does that look like? Is, are we going to treat this like an ICF where, okay, hey, things aren't working out. We're going to go ahead and terminate the contract as a utility and find another entity that can maybe carry out the work um, uh, more adequately. You know, I, I, I hate to throw Montgomery County under the bus in this very hypothetical situation. I know this wouldn't be the case, but, you know, this is just, uh, you know, just, just an example. Um, you know, so it, is that where, you know, that relationship would look like or would it be, more along the lines of like almost a fully independent, just, hey, you know, Montgomery County, you are on the hook for certain goals that are independent from what the utilities are trying to accomplish. And then therefore, you know, what do those programs look like? Make sure there's no duplicating of efforts. Uh, saying that, that that would be the more convoluted, more complex process. But, um, you know, just something to think about. There's a couple of different ways you can carve up this situation. Yeah, thank you, sir. And the way I understood, Lindsay, was it was more of the, the latter. Um, all right, we got uh, Nicole and then Joe and Jim. Thank you, Your Honor. Nicole Zeitner on behalf of OPC. One thing that's been asked a few times during this conversation is, is whether the parties proposing third party opportunities can prove that third parties can consistently do these things better. And I don't think that's that's not what OPC is saying, and I don't believe that's what anyone is saying. I think what we're saying, what OPC is saying, is that there are five things that are proven to make for better programs. And I, I know at some point we have to address the fact whether the utilities are willing to do one of those very big things, which is accept performance-based earnings. And I think that's relevant to this conversation. There's been some suggestion that they don't oppose that, but no one has actually answered that question. And I think that's worth bringing up in this conversation so we know whether the utilities are willing to do the five things that are done in the best energy efficient jurisdictions. And, and we know that third parties probably would. We know that third parties will be willing to do that because I think every proposal for third party opportunities includes a goal based or a compensation based on, based on results. So um, I think that also goes along with, with metrics. So if a third party were involved, they, make more money or they make money depending on whether they met their portion of the goal. So I, I do tend to think that there would be a portion of the empower goal that's given to that third party. And then that third party is, is compensated based on their results. And my question for the utilities would be is, are the utilities willing to accept that form of a payment structure? Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, Josh, I see you unmuted, please. Oh. You want yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks again, Your Honor. And I, I, I realize I'm, I'm very vocal today, and I'm usually no. Not, it's good so. stuff. <laughs> I am a little concerned about Nicole's comment about whether or not a utility is is willing to do something. Um, you know, if we're if you know, I know if we're, we're not. <laughs> there's a lot of things out there, you know, that you know, um, you know, that utilities would not be willing to do if it runs contrary to any kind of objectives we're trying to meet or if it's not in the best interest of our ratepayers. And so um, it shouldn't be a question of whether or not utilities willing to do something. It's a question of whether or not a utility is capable of doing something. Okay. If we're the only reason why we'd want to have another third party involved is just because they're more eager and more willing to do something. No, it's because we have found a gap, a blind spot and the capacity of what the utility is able to achieve through Empower Maryland. Um, it's not about, you know, hey, um, this, this other company is really excited to do this and they're willing to do something that the utilities aren't. I don't think that's a very, um, very accurate description of kind of what third parties should be doing and, and why they would want to be brought on board. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, all right. Let's see. We got Joe and then Jim. Yeah. So, uh, this, uh, you know, the innovative uh, uh, carve out uh, definitely is uh, sounds like something like the PID, the uh, the PIDs, these pilot demonstration uh, projects that the commission has been approving quite a you know a significant amount of resources towards the last few years. And I just want to note that in the con uh, in, in that context that we. We're actually wrestling. So the, the commission has directed us to evaluate those those PIDs and those pilot uh, demonstration projects. And so we're wrestling with that right now in the evaluation advisory group about how exactly do we do that? Because, you know, are we evaluating against uh, uh, 
uh, impacts, you know, megawatt hour impacts, you know, they're not claiming savings towards goal. Um, and so, we, you know, we don't necessarily evaluate the same way we would do a full fledged program. Ultimately, what I'm where I've kind of landed right now, uh, you know, and this could this could morph some, but as we evaluated against what the utilities are claiming, they would the pilots would do. So did the pilots only are the pilots only designed to tell them how much they'd increase participation or or something else? And then we evaluate rather than, you know, megawatt hour impacts, you know, like we would do a goal. We evaluate toward evaluate the claims made by the utilities when they uh, obtained approval from the commission. So that's where that's where I'm currently at. And I raise that because here um, I'm hearing I'm kind of hearing some mixed messages so i'm a little uh, unclear so i'm hearing uh lindsey shaw uh say you know that this carve out should they're innovative and you need room to experiment and uh you know you try new things out it's a laboratory in a sense uh, that can then be adopted by uh, the larger in the larger system and that makes sense to me there's a lot of arguments for that i'm then hearing that in the third party this in the third party context that i think nicole's suggesting well the third parties would be subjected to uh, performance uh, incentives. And yet the PIDs, it, to the extent that the carve out is like the PIDs, the pilots currently, there's no, uh, those pilots are not all claiming savings towards goal. In fact, I don't think really any of them, hardly any of them are. We're certainly not a, necessarily just evaluating them towards that. Um, if we did, they would probably all fail. And so I'm not, there's a little bit of disconnect that would need to be uh, 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 to look to look at looked at uh, on that. And uh, I just also add that in terms of the notion of having a carve out that is not evaluated, um, uh, uh, you know, per empower standards. My suspicion is the commission. The commission has gone in exactly the opposite direction over the last few years, where the pilots, and I think it's been driven by OPC and others uh, to at least some extent, uh, that the commission is actually wanting more rigorous evaluation of these innovative uh, pilots, not less. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Gravatt. Thank you, Your Honor. Jim Gravatt on behalf of the Energy Advocates. I'm going back and forth about whether I have anything to add to this conversation or not, but I'll try. Um, in the, in the first place, I mean, a carve out is a different thing, certainly than what I suggested. And I'm, and I'm trying to understand, it seems like there's some objection to the idea of, it, of having any kind of third party programs. There are some real concerns around it. And at least as I proposed it, sort of the principles that I suggested, I think really all I was trying to do is say, let's make sure that we have the opportunity to use tools that can help us if it makes sense. I mean, I, I'm certainly not saying, as I said before, I, I'm not advocating for this open market kind of approach at all. I'm not implementing, I'm not advocating for anyone to take over from the utilities. Um, third party programs should only be preferred when, to the extent that they can achieve greater levels of savings, achieve comparable savings more effectively or efficiently in comparison with utility programs, increase access to empower benefits for underserved populations. And these are things that the utilities should support, I think. If, if a third party program can do this better than what the utilities have done, they should support it. And if a third party program can't do it better, then there's no third party program. That's what I see. Um, I, I've said it should be encompassed within the utility strategic plan and objectives should be specifically articulated. So I'm certainly not advocating for, here's a chunk of money, third party, do whatever you wanna do. I, I, just, I just don't see that any of these things are really in conflict with the utilities achieving their goals. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, and uh, Lindsay, there's no need to pull your, uh, your, your carve out idea back. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. I mean, that's why we're, that's why we're doing this. I saw something in the chat about it, but um, you know, if it's something you, you like, you know, you, you know, speak your mind. Uh, that's that's why we're we're considering. You know, who knows what the future is going to hold for Empower? Maybe maybe a car battle uh, will be uh, will be granted. Who knows? Maybe you'll be the pilot. So please don't 
Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, this is, you know, we, we need to spitball different ideas here. Uh, Joe and then Dylan. Yeah, I, I just want to provide a clarification in case I've been unclear uh, per Jim's comment. I am not opposed to any third to any sort of third party policy or uh, implementation. I totally agree that if there are good ideas out there, that they should be uh, vetted and implemented uh, to the extent uh, uh, that it makes sense to do so. And uh, my my biggest personally, my biggest challenge today is just understanding what we're talking about. You know what what the specifics of these third party. Uh, uh, no ideas are and so that we can so that i can you know at least i at least i kind of need that to uh uh to be able to you know discuss it in uh in any real way and so i think and i haven't heard anything from anyone else uh, uh suggesting a wholesale rejection of uh of some sort of third party implementation i think the questions are just around you know what are we talking about for me that's that's the question yeah, I, I think, I mean, we've talked around it. There's been a couple of different floating ideas, and I don't think we've actually reached a consensus. Uh, Dylan and then Erica. Dylan? You there? Yes, sorry, Your Honor. I had okay. two, mute, two mutes on. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Dylan Ford, he's VEIC working with OPC. Um, so I have two two uh, comments. W one uh, does follow a little bit to I think Joe's question, and it comes a, a little bit on the discussion we've had about the the current um, structure for you know pr proposals about third parties. And um, I I don't I I think what I'm focused on is is having a a structure that is conducive to um idea generation and program uh idea generation and third parties included in that and i think the it, it, we we don't have to list i don't feel um i, I don't feel really c compelled to sort of give specific examples of program ideas that you know the EIC wants to see happen um, in order to you know make the case that we need a, a, a system and a structure that is conducive to that we actually do have I think a number of, of examples have been given Jim you know Jim talked about his experience um, we've talked about some of the market transformation ideas. I actually don't think the the finance example is a great success. I think that um, I don't I don't think that was a, a process that has sort of worked to expeditiously bring sort of new ideas to in, into practice. But the the problem with the 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 way it's happening now is that you know the utilities are in charge effectively of establishing the criteria for accepting new ideas and then they actually also make those decisions and the, and it happens in a not very transparent way and i think looking uh it, you know through those those technical sessions and and the follow up uh, and i think you know jim you might have identified that there were also other reasons your your proposal wasn't accepted but Part of the point is you don't actually know <laughs> because you just got thanks no thanks and i think looking more broadly it is indicative of the fact that in maryland a lot of the program development and the, the planning is happening by utilities in a pretty closed way um they're really just and it's there's there's good programs there's many good programs there are examples of innovation i'm not saying that that doesn't that that's absent completely absent but um don't think that there's as robust a, a sort of inclusive and transparent way of of developing program ideas and doing planning um and i would say that you know having a stakeholder council or or board uh which do operate in in many of the leading states is a, a an anecdote to that that challenge and it creates a more transparent space for bringing forward ideas where the utility is not the primary judge and gatekeeper. Um, that's that's was my main comment. I also just wanted to follow up on the, 
sort of question that Nicole posed a minute ago, and Josh, you responded to about you know whether utilities are willing to move to performance-based based earnings. Um, it, the question is not whether they're capable. We know that <laughs> we know that utility administrators are capable of operating in a performance-based earnings context because they do that in many states you know <laughs> that so we know that already i think the question here in maryland is you know is it possible to get toward that and and would the utilities sort of be on board or, or cooperative toward making a transition um you know from the status quo where that is is absent to to that being the 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 way that we do things and i think that that's kind of the question not whether it's not whether it's possible i think we know it possible um so that, that's sort of maybe a helpful clarification all right uh josh how'd you end up sir uh yeah uh, i think thanks for that dylan um yeah i, I kind of just i'm sorry I, I i had my hand uh, oh i'm, I'm sorry erica, oh, erica. Sorry. <laughs> no problem I, apologize. I jumped you no problem um i just wanted to just quickly add um i think that uh miss shaw's proposal is an interesting proposal um, for Prince George's County, it's just a little bit more complex, I think, in some ways because of how we are organized in the county. Um, and so I would like to just expand a little bit on Lindsay's concept and better understand. I've seen the, the I've seen a lot in the, the chat and the conversations about the terminology of municipalities. So in Prince George's County, we have over 20 municipalities. And within those municipalities, we have approximately three utilities that are operating. So if we are referring to a third party and we would allow municipalities, um, it requires a little bit more thought and um, discussion about how would we as, would the county itself be classified as a third party? Um, because the definition of a county at the Public Service Commission differs um, with many rulings from a municipality. Um, so are we looking at it from a county scale, Lindsay? Are we looking at it from, for instance, in Montgomery County, would it be the city of Rockville in conjunction with uh, Montgomery County? Um, so those are some of the questions that just sort of jump out initially when we're looking at sort of um, leveraging the Empower Maryland opportunities with what we currently implement using the Exelon and Washington Gas merger funds. Um, I would also like to note to uh, the, I think her name was Teresa from PHI. Um, I'm not sure if Lindsay is aware, but there has been a level of reporting by local governments. I believe Montgomery County is doing it as well over the past three to four years on our progress with implementing uh, merger conditions. And those reporting elements, those metrics that we've been reporting, things such as how much we're spending an annually, how many kilowatt hours we're expected to uh, conserve from our program. How, for instance, with Prince George's County, we also um, fund solar PV systems, solar thermal, how many um, kilowatt hours are expected to be generated. That type of information has been and is continuously being um, reported to PHI on an annual basis. And it's my understanding that information is wrapped up or folded into a economic report that actually is submitted to the Public Service Commission. Um, so just wanted to add uh, my two cents to the conversation and, and really hope that we can have a more detailed dialogue um, as a part of this process, or maybe even a sidebar meeting um, where we bring in Prince George's, Montgomery County, and others who would like to participate to, to talk about some of the complexities. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I think it's definitely, um, uh, you know, if you guys want to meet uh, off to the side, that's great. I know it sounded like Lindsay's um, proposal was more of a, I don't want to say off the cuff, um, um, but I agree it does sound um, interesting and maybe it uh, could be flushed out a little bit more um josh uh thank you honor i will uh i will refrain from from comments i think um yeah i, I kind of lost my train of thought so i don't want to just start rambling on thank you all right all right sorry about that all right um anybody else i know i think the marin are you here i know we haven't um touched on your uh the comments you submitted yet 
uh, just uh, related to third parties. Hi, Your Honor. Um, oh. I apologize. I was on. You're fine. Um, yes. Um, I in uh, I did not. I don't think we actually commented on third parties. Uh, sorry, you're on mute, Your Honor. Sorry. Um, all right. Uh, well, if if you didn't comment on that, or uh, then maybe we can just say that until after lunch. Then. Um, all right. Uh, sorry about that, Marin. No, thank you. Um, all right. So it's it's about twenty of one. We've been going for a while. Uh, good discussions. Uh, it, it it would I think it would still be beneficial at least to to some folks, a lot of folks, if we could try and wrestle down and decide what an actual third party opportunity is. Is it is it something a separate contractor that the utility has no control over that's getting paid within power funds? Is it or is it something else that that's how kind of i'm envisioning it but that i might be in the minority there so just something to think about um why don't we plan on coming back at 115 maybe we can nail down the third party definition issue and then we'll move on to uh legislation okay all right sounds we'll good thank you thank you